Bonjour. Welcome in. Bienvenue. Welcome. Come in. It's Tinker Taylor Solder Fry here on the Mighty Loading Radio Fun Video Entertainment Network. My name's Ian, and we've got Alex here How'd on do? the table with me. Because it's a special one. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. But before we get into that, it's, it's a let's try program. We don't we, we don't give you instructions on how to do things. You do that yourself. Definitely which... don't do this. <laughs> well, I mean, give it a try, but don't expect uh, results immediately. It's, it's this is going to be a tough one. This is going to be an important yeah, one. Yeah, this is a this is going to be a good one because mm -hmm. like I'm going to be trying a bunch of stuff that I haven't done before. Oh, I'm excited to see when when you came to me with the the, the concept behind this particular so, program. To, well, to, <laughs> to briefly introduce this. Before we get to that, yeah, one, do, one, do, one do more the, thing. Do the schmoz. we got to we'll thank uh, about this. the rest of you at home for your support over patreon.com slash loading ready run. Uh, you keep the lights on, you keep the, uh, the, 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 the water flowing, and you allow things like this to happen. What is this, Alex? <laughs> so, I don't know where I got this idea, but um, we're building a 1792 guillotine. One fifth scale, seventeen ninety two. That's oddly yeah. specific. Uh, well, according to these uh, blueprints, uh, in seventeen ninety two, the first guillotine was built by Tobias Schmidt, a German harpsichord builder who had his workshop at the Cour de Commerce in Paris, and he was assigned to make the machine. Uh, the first guillotine from seventeen ninety two does not exist anymore, and no one can give you an exact description of all the measurements and parts. <laughs> But studying old drawings and visiting museums in France and Belgium gave me a pretty good idea on how the 1792 guillotine was built. This model description is partly based on measurements taken from a real guillotine in the uh, start of the 19th century. And then there's like other stuff. So um, I purchased the PDF of these blueprints mm -hmm. because it is, this is like a really hardcore um, kind of thing. Paul was under the impression that this was a kit. Because we've done okay, kits maybe we can the, get the close up on this. Before. Yeah, well, like, yeah, I, I sort of assumed that this was, uh, yeah, some sort oh, of... Oh, it's not a kit. It's the directions and then good luck. Yeah. This so is... there's... That's what all the parts will look like when they're finished. And then the rest is just detailed measurements on everything that you need to build to make it work. Huh. Um, so this is this is not only to make just like any old guillotine. This, this is a this specific, exact one. Yeah. Um, in one fifth scale. Mm -hmm. Measurements taken from the actual like museum exhibits and stuff. Yeah. Draw. And because it's French, all the measurements are in uh, centimeters oh, and millimeters. <laughs> Which I'm. I, I'd actually. I've never built uh, something using uh, metric before. Really? Yeah. So it's been interesting learning all that, and I think it's it's been good for me. Except technically speaking, wouldn't this guillotine have been made just slightly before the French Revolution, where they switched over to metric? <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so ninety-five percent of the kit is made from oak, and then there's a handful of metal parts that are supposed to be made of iron. I'm sorry, made of. Made of iron. iron. Okay. And I wanted to do iron, but you can't find it anywhere. <laughs> you just like, you, like has craft, the supply chain no, gone just that like, badly? Well, the thing is, like, craft iron, mm -hmm. like just iron to make stuff with, practically doesn't exist. It's all steel. What? Um, I I actually spoke to a blacksmith, and he said that um, you can sometimes find it as like wrought iron off of like old wagon wheel spokes and stuff like that. And it's actually like quite prized by blacksmiths because it's like this So you gotta go out there and, and just material. like rob people's gates and whatnot. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but, so I was like, I guess I have to use steel. But I guess presumably who's ever making the steel has to have some iron. Yeah, but it's all like turn, it, it, iron is now like basically a transitional material because like, um, like it's, for most purposes, steel is just better in every way. It, I mean, I I, th I think I'm getting this right that it's strictly better than iron, <laughs> because steel is a form of it, iron that has a measured carbon content. It's it's strictly better than iron in the same way that a strictly better magic card is, by which I mean, it'd be like, well, no, no, no. What if, what if I have a situation where that high casting cost is actually an asset. <laughs> I mean, I Then guess it's not strictly better, is it? If you want metal that's more brittle? Yeah. 
So these are the two crossbars. I'm just gonna start laying out the materials here and then I can we can talk about some other stuff. The nice thing about uh, talking about metal and magic cards in the same uh, breath is that casting cost matters. <laughs> uh, Alex, I think your mic kind of dropped down your shirt there. Oh, oh my no. God. So uh, all the wood I have here is, oh, except for these, which I found. That was a very nice cherry. Um, if you could use your First Nations powers to identify that, is that cedar? I think so. Okay, well, yeah, I found this and... <laughs> Seems harder though. Maybe. I don't know what kind of wood this is, but it's like, it'll probably work. This, these are the, the base that these will sit on. So this is not full size then? No, it's one-fifth scale. Okay. Which is a weird thing. So I spent um, a bunch so of time. So you would take like five, you have to take five wax at one person in order to. <laughs> <laughs> Cut your victim up into smaller parts before feeding them into the guillotine. Um, to avoid jamming the guillotine. So quite shamefully, I didn't film this part where I sawed all the the lumber, mm -hmm. and these are all very diligently marked. That looks I think like, looks like one of those really old-fashioned like children. It's like it's Lincoln Logs or you know some <laughs> in children's a, in a manner of speaking, like plaything. It is Lincoln Logs. Rob's Pierre rods. <laughs> so we've got all the the raw lumber, but this is all just like roughly cut to size. And what we're going to be doing today is um, doing the finishing work. Oh, well, wait, there's more. Partial assembly. Yeah, there's going to be part uh, partial assembly and uh, finishing work on a lot of this. What direction does this box open? There we go. Oh. Um, so we actually there's uh, I I used our local makerspace mm -hmm. to work on a bunch of this stuff. Um, and I actually have some footage for that. Oh, excellent. Um, so I guess I can put these parts out first. Because one, the, yeah, one of the weird parts, it's a little, like, it's mostly wood, some steel, some brass, mm -hmm. and one piece that's made of lead. Ah, uh huh. Just a big old hunk of lead? Just a, that's the weight. Um, I also have templated two blades. Oh. Because I haven't decided what size. Because mm -hmm. um, you get two different thick gauges. Yeah, there. two different gauges. This one is like a little bit under two millimeters, which is what it says to use, and mm -hmm. this one's a nice honk at three mm -hmm. millimeters. So we'll figure that out eventually. Um, here's the parts from the triggering mechanism that I still need to saw out. I'll probably have to do that at home because mm -hmm. it's uh, a lot of work. I just uh, have to cope. Believe this is <laughs> this is the the bottom rail for the the blade, and this is part of the top. And then I have some nuts, which might be a little too big. Oh wow! Oh yeah. By the way, I made it... I made this hardware here from scratch. <laughs> we have uh, if we can get a close up. The man makes his own nuts, people. Uh. So we get, what, you, just get right in there on those. Yeah, these are these are quite small. But yeah, I decided let's go hard, and I made my own nuts and bolts. Because um, okay. working with brass is actually like not so bad. Nice soft metal. Yep. Um, same with the pulley wheels, which I had a chunk of bronze. But I made those out of these ones. I'm not too happy with. I might actually remake them at some point. But should you do those on the lathe? Yeah, we, look we will see that in a second. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's roll that clip, and you can see how I got to work on all this stuff. Ooh. So, so during the revolution, the, uh, the uh, uh, a regular guillotine, you know, be used on the bourgeoisie. But of course, this is a one-fifth size, <laughs> so it'd be used for the petit bourgeoisie. <laughs> <laughs> Le petit bourgeoisie. <laughs> uh, all right, we've got uh, video, so we'll, we'll this will be a uh, video that uh, and and uh, Alex 
and uh, Ian can kind of we'll yeah, talk us through this. It, yeah. And uh, yeah, let me know if you want to pause it. Or yeah. I can't believe I get to see this. Roll 227. <laughs> what? So this is our local makerspace um, up at uh, Interurban Campus. Mm -hmm. So I kind of started with uh, doing the lead. Um, this is uh, my lead melting pot that I use for bullet casting normally. Oh. And this turned out to be um, a dreadful mistake. <laughs> oh, what, what? because it was not the not the right way to do it. I figured that you know I could I could make a temporary mold by arranging pieces of metal and then just like pour. And the pour was very very slow. Oh yes. Oh, because so, this is normally <laughs> for making bullets, so you don't yeah, need so a lot it, of yeah. So it needs like a, a little tiny bit, and I think that yeah, I needed to clean it. Uh, so I ended up just like getting this pathetic dribble that I had to use the blowtorch on to get it into shape eventually. What an interesting method. Yeah, it's not good. Mm. Um, I milled it afterwards. Um, and let me tell you, lead is not the kind of stuff that you want to mill. That doesn't sound like it's not. It's not that it's like dangerous, it just sucks. Mm. It's very gooey. I, I, I would believe it. But. Yeah, you want to you wanna run it like pretty low speed because the second it heats up at all, it just like turns into gum. Is there any sort of special procedures you need to work with there? Um, I don't think you're supposed to be milling lead ever. Okay. It's just like, why would you do that? Answer, you're an idiot like me. Um, uh, lead is, of course, toxic and dangerous, but yes. um, some of the aspects of its danger are a little overstated. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that they don't exist, but I mean, people do sort of behave as if, like, if you look at it, it'll kill you. Yeah. When the, the major problems are from uh, ingestion and inhalation. Mm -hmm. So this is me milling the top off with a nice big coarse, <laughs> extremely slow running uh, end mill, because I wanted to get it down to the the right size. Right. Oh, I love the mill. You're making some pretty wide passes there. Yep, it's like it's a pretty coarse finish, and it doesn't because it doesn't need to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, and doing the edges, this block that you see here is actually the second one I did. I did a first one, and it was it was too close to um, to size, and it ended up undersized. So I just said, "Oh, to hell with it." So here's the chunk of bronze that I had which we turned on the lathe. I right. say we mean me. This is a, a new lathe that the space has that I'm very happy with and I'm very trepidatiously learning how it works because <laughs> the one we had before is about half as big as this one. So why, why would you use bronze instead of steel? Um, in this case, I had some. Okay. And the, the directions say to use uh, the, the direction said to, to use brass. I didn't have brass stock in this size, but I did have this little nub of bronze. At least I'm pretty sure it's bronze. <laughs> what? 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 What is? I don't actually know what the difference. Uh, brass is. Brass is um, or... zinc and copper. Bronze is tin and copper. Wow. So here we are, center drilling it. There's something I love about milling where you spin the thing and leave the... Yeah, so like here when we're drilling, <laughs> the the stock rotates the work and then the drill stays stationary. Which makes sense, but it's just like, it's that's so weird. weird looking, yeah. Um, I took a, um, a carbide uh, tool that had sadly had a, a very hard life uh, and I... Um, I use the grinder on it to sort of shape like an end nose. Also, you can see halfway through this clip that I realized I was running the mill or the delayed the wrong direction. Ooh. <laughs> Which just means it didn't do anything. <laughs> That's you, why you're you want gonna... it turning towards you into the, the piece. Uh... And this is my favorite feature about the new lathe is you can change chuck really easily. Because the previous one, Bach, uh, you had to take out three long screws that were um, recessed in such a way that you needed to use a specialized like short shank uh, Allen key and it took like half an hour yeah. 
Yeah, I'm surprised at how quickly you got that thing swapped out. Yeah, it's like it's three lugs that <laughs> to, have. To be fair, he is. It is. This is bit of footage. <laughs> so this was yeah. This was me working on um, the steel nuts, and these might be a little oversized, but that might not be a problem. You can, it's a lot harder to put uh, material back on things with a lathe. It really is. Um, you can't really do that too much, although uh, this old Tony manages to do it a lot of the time. The channel rules, by the way. Um, this is, of course, the advantage of the four-jaw chuck is you can hold square objects or, like, off-center objects. Uh -huh. um, and so here's the brass bar that uh, turned into these nuts here. It looks a lot bigger than it is, then. Yeah. Um, and then the, the last little clip is... Uh, I hate... This was the best shot I could get um, because the the camera kept like falling over. So I used um, rubber cement to stick the printed out um, schematics, cool. and then did the rough cutting with an angle grinder. God, it's such a hack job here. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time at home with hand files, uh, getting these dressed down to um, more or less final dimensions. Um, I actually had to to create these templates um, in Illustrator mm. because uh, these directions are not to scale. Right. They have all the all the directions, but they're not size as. So I had to go to the page with um, the uh, the blade on it, for example. And then, luckily, like all these objects were. Um, vector objects in the PDF anyways, oh, and good. so I could like pull them out um, and printed those and then cut them out. So yeah, like for example, this piece, which is all the, the triggering parts with all their markings, I have to like probably just spend a year <laughs> hand filing this or find some sort of like coping saw that can handle steel. Ooh, yeah, that's gonna be a problem. I, I thought about making this out of brass, and maybe that would be the smarter thing, because then I could use like a jeweler's saw and then just like cut yeah. the whole thing out. But it said to make this out of iron or steel. <laughs> so, oh right, if and you my have iron, my steel um, will do in a pinch. my secret project related to this. Oh, which secrets, which nobody knows about. So we're doing a bunch of woodworking. Right. I didn't have a woodworking marking gauge. Right. But I did have some walnuts, so I made one. You. What? That is beautiful. It's not finished, but but it should be functional. So, I saw the um, the design for this on like Amazon or something. Yeah. And it should it should work for our purposes. It has like a chisel guide and then just like. A regular guide. Now, I've never owned one of these, so um, I'll be learning how to use this. <laughs> the idea is that um, you set a distance um, on. Actually, yeah. See the the little tab here uh, fell out. That's been a freaking nightmare. Yeah, that is pretty tight. So you set um, a distance between the face of this and one of these markers, right. and then you can just like run it along oh, the work yeah. and it scores it where it needs to be cut or like grooved or whatever. So um, eventually there's going to be like a threaded uh, insert here, probably made out of brass and then like a knob to turn it down. Mm -hmm. And then I'll get a replacement uh, handle for this. Um, I was fortunate enough, sometimes you just find the things that you need lying around Makerspace, and one of those things was um, a uh, like a router slot tool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I used to, to cut the channel here. For making your tea. So channel. it's unfortunately like kind of off-center, because I, I think I milled out the, um, uh, the bar here before I realized the, uh, the mill had not been trammed recently. <laughs> but it, it should work. And this was like a fun little thing to, to do. Nice. So I've, I've got a piece of brass shim stock that's uh, sort of securing it. Holding it in place right now. So I'm hoping this will work for the, um, uh, the little, I don't know what they're called, but 
There's a there's a thing we need to make with like a thing sticking out. Okay. I brought forbidden knowledge. Uh, oh, uh, Reader's Digest. Wow. Woodworking tips from a book. Wow. This is. I think Reader's Digest isn't that like the opposite of forbidden knowledge. No. It's... <laughs> this is actually like a pretty handy little book. It's a very well illustrated. Yeah, it, like it's got it's got illustrations on pretty much all basic like homeowner. Very like simple um, entry level, just like all process the, work. All the stuff conservatives would tell us we're supposed we to learn go. in schools. Yeah, pretty much. So like, this kind of stuff, I think is going to be useful. So like, we'll have to cut a recess. I think. Oh yeah, basic information about how to do that. Sort of you know stuff. how to use a a, a, a woodworking lathe, what? not a proper lathe. <laughs> also, this isn't. This is an old book. How to identify wood properly. Yep, that's wood. Yep. Oh, it's got a cheat sheet and everything. Hey, metric conversion. Put put a magnet on it. If it if it doesn't if it sticks, it's probably not wood. Yeah. This is definitely a book that I would want to hang on to. Um, yeah. During a like a total like power outage situation. I, I had to. I, I had to learn, uh, read fancy uh, design blogs to find out about how wood is sawn into various parts, but. This book actually has it. So, um, I also brought tools. Oh, thank goodness. Gosh, I brought a lot of tools. And I don't, I mean, I went a little bit nuts. So I don't imagine that I'll need all of these, but... It's always know, good to have them and not need them. I love restoring old tools. So this is my coffin plane. A. Which I got from uh, a surplus store. This is my carving mallet that I made. Yes. Mall. This I think we're gonna use um, a lot, probably a razor saw. I would like, I want a dozuki, mm -hmm. but I don't have one. <sighs> I, 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 I picked one up for a wood project a while back from Harbor Freight and uh, ended up taking it back because I didn't think that it was uh, useful for what I was doing. I, did, I do have oh. this one, but this might be a little bit uh, heavy duty. That's for... a good size murder saw. I don't remember what the name of this type of saw is. I also think I need a screwdriver to put it in place. This will be important. Ah, yes. This might be important. It's a teeny little miter box. Hey, nice. This will be important. Ah, yes. God, I don't know how I got along without Calipers. Calipers. This is like the most unreasonably useful tool. If you've got a, uh, if you've got a, a, a friend that uh, does work or does any sort of making, uh, from model making all the way up to uh, making making, and they don't have a set of good for calipers, get them. Set of calipers. I think most of the rest of this is chisels. Ooh. Yeah, so these are. These should be. So I, sh I sharpened all of these recently, so I think that they should be almost... Oh, Making no. the noise. Maybe not that one. Maybe this one. I'm still learning my way around sharpening. One of the best skills to have. It's very important and a lot harder than I thought. Ah, I failed. Oh no. Sensei. I just kind of like the idea of, of chiseling pieces off of a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. Also, I don't know that I'll need these, but I this was another restoration oh, project. Hey. Of I have uh, four different types of dividers. Yeah. I have outside dividers. I have inside dividers. And then like the wide ones. Mm -hmm. And then like little teeny ones. So, those might just be like building the lily kind of thing. I also brought my batty whapper. Ah, we, but we, sorry, batty whapper. It's my batty whapper. And we're going to use it to whap batties. Yes. Perfect. I just, I wanted to make a cute little like cartoon style hammer, and I love this thing. <laughs> For when you cast the wrestling like, bell. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> That's adorable. Cute, 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 cute. Yeah. What? It's... Isn't it adorable? Oh, that's fantastic. Like, no store sells this. 
It's just like I want the hammer that like I don't know Super Mario uses. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, do, 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 <laughs> so yeah, I, I had like a piece of stock. I don't think this is hardened steel, which um, makes it not perfect, but just for the kind of small work that uh, it would be used for, it's Less probably fine. Shipping that way yeah. too. You need to find a little teeny weeny road runner. <laughs> <Just> bang. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. We can start, I guess, at the beginning. Yeah, so what do we do here? So there's a, um, I'm trying to think of, there's a couple ways we could start this. Like, because it goes through um, each of the, the parts, mm -hmm. which I all have together. And then there's the assembly instructions, which are roughly in similar order. So, yeah, doing the um, doing the feet, and then getting a start on the uprights is probably going to be what we're going to do. So, are are those um, plans for the one fifth scale, or are yep. you one fifthing? No, the no, plan? no. Oh God, no! I can't do that <laughs> kind of math. No, that's the the plans are all for the one fifth scale version. Um, yeah, they're just right on the plans They are uh, right two, plans four, here. six. Unit, mil ah, I was about to ask what units, and, it and they tell me, unit, millimeter, material, wood. From Jorn Fabricius. 2001, he was working on this. I mean, the class war never ends. <laughs> Okay, so I think the first thing is going to be a lot of marking. This is a very good little piece here. Right? So we have three mm -hmm. slots on the top. And I'm trying to see it's 15. Oh, it's offset. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah. But that's actually not so bad. So this will be when we can try using this for the very first time. Okay, so I need something that is, we need to set the width. Yeah, so the center. The width of that slot is 10 millimeters. And that is the case for, it looks like all three. So I'm gonna okay. set the micrometer or the calipers to 10 millimeters. Eventually, there we go. Oh, that's close. And I use that to set the width of these fences here. So these should be 10 millimeters apart. So as to Carve a slot. I think that bulged outwards when I was. Yeah, you gotta be careful when setting those. <laughs> yeah. I guess I've got to go point to point. Mm, that's also tough. Well, we'll get there. Because yeah. once we get this set, I should just be able to go zip, zip, zip. There was like versions of this that or adjustable. There we go. That looks like 10 millimeters. So I'm, I'm measuring point to point so that these markers are 10 millimeters apart. So exactly. then we need to set one side 22 millimeters mm -hmm. offset and that should let that, us mark that'll get us our two outer holes so then that goes point to face it's got to be kind of close-ish Let's 
just going to make sure this doesn't move. This is where having the screw will come in handy. <laughs> come on, you can do it. I think that's about right. Okay, so this is now marked 22 and then 10. So we should just be able to go on here. In theory, anyway. Should we go? Oh yeah, I can see that. I can't see the second one. There we go. And this wood is softer than I thought. <laughs> it's a nice, good scrub. Kinda. Let's, I'm just gonna check to make sure that that's still. Yeah, that's still still accurate. Oh, that is really offset. Let me, I'm just going to check this other side measurement to make cool, sure. Cool, right, yes. Measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. We're looking, we're looking at 15 mils on one side, 22 on the other. Whoa, how did that get off so far? Let's try that again. <laughs> I think I might need to like very carefully control this. I'm gonna be so pissed if I like cut this wrong. Forty forty four, hang on a second. Forty four across, yeah. Okay, this is this is the this correct is 44, okay. <laughs> Am I going crazy? Is it like not adding up to So Oh wait a second. Fifteen and twenty two Oh this middle one's also different. Yeah, that's so what happened. Twenty two. 15 plus is 10 plus 15. 22 plus 10 is 32. Four, that's 47. What the fuck? Those numbers don't add up. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> okay, hang on. Let's let's mark one of these with pencil. Yeah. We'll get our square. Oh, you know what I think? What? It might be that these holes are shorter than this one is. It still looks like it's showing the... Well, now I don't know. Blueprints. Let me go right to, down to the bottom. It says riveting television, isn't it? <laughs> um, okay, so 15 millimeters. Oh! What? The interior is marked on these ones. Seven. Oh, so neat. 15 and seven is 20. Yeah, so these do add up. Good. Okay. Yeah, these outer holes, the width is uh, seven millimeters. It's only the center hole that has a uh, width of 10 millimeters. Check the little seven in there versus the 10. I swear, this is fucking whack. Because, like, that distance there is supposed to be 22, and that's supposed to be 15. Yep. And then add 7, and that makes 30, and that, and that makes 44. Wait, the slot is 44? The, the slot is 7. Oh! Yeah. Oh, so, oh, this is a different slot. Yes. Oh, okay. It's actually, not only is it a different slot, it's in a different position on the board. Okay, so well, we, that's good yeah. that we... So we should mark out these two, do those, and then do that one third, I think. Okay. And we need to figure out how far from the end this is. Okay. Oh, lordy lord. Uh, 16 millimeter. So right from the end. This is the other great thing about a, cal uh, a caliper. I'll show you this in a second. Yeah, see, because, like, that's going to the edge there, from that edge to there, mm -hmm. 16, right? That's my reading of it? Yes, yes. So if I go like this, check this out. 
Yeah, I love that the calipers have sharp Yeah, notes. because because the tool's made of hard steel, you can just use it to scribe like that. And you know what, while we're doing that, let's mark this one as well. Mm -hmm. It's a cheeky little mark. Come on. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. So let me check this again. I don't think we're ever going to be checking this too frequently. Oh no. <laughs> okay, so that's twenty okay, so that's still twenty-two. And I need to set this fence to seven huh. now, because that's how wide those holes are. I see. Can I close this as far as seven? Oh no. Yeah, maybe. Just barely. Yes, I can. Okay, I just have to open it just a hair. I mean, at least we're not at the point where there we're we compensating for kerf right yet. Jeez. Okay, so. That took. Just gonna define that a little bit. Yeah, that looks that looks about right. With I can sixteen, we do not have any such uh, scale rulers with dents. Now, unless I'm wrong, we're going to want to go like that for this side. You are entirely correct. Yeah, they should be mirrored to each other. It's the last fucking thing I want to do is. That's a nice scribe. There we go. And, and this so. is... Twenty-eight millimeters in length. Yes. That's a lot longer than I thought. The scale on the drawing is so cracked. <laughs> Like, I get that it's not to scale and you have to go by the measurements, but holy shit. It does not look bueno. The, the, the isometricism of it is a little bit... confuddling. Let's use our square to scribe this. My scribe went missing. <laughs> FYI. Really? Yeah, like my just... my I just had like a, a pencil scribe. Oh, okay. Which is, it's just like a, it's a spike. Yep. For spiking I, stuff. I think you may have shown that off on a Tinker Tailor like a long time ago. I, I, remember, I could believe it. I remember you built the Kitty Dashi that you were planning to use for scribing. Yeah, I, um, oh yeah, I did, I, I brought one of these. I think I tried rehardening this one mm -hmm. and it still didn't quite go. So I guess I can use this for scribing. Ian, how do those look as scribe slots? Those are, I can see where those are, and they look mirrored correctly, so I'm saying okay. good. Oh, you sneaky bugger, it's not mirrored front to back mm -hmm. either. Okay, so next set of, let's keep this in the same orientation so it doesn't fuck us. Yes. And let's move one down the line. Okay. Well, we've got, actually, we've got the, the uh, the, uh... Because this is the same, oh yeah, let, let's do that. One. So, I need to find out... How far from this edge? This is going to be a bunch of math, because Which it's going to be... 40, 16, that's 56, 106. 106? 106, I believe, if I'm reading this correctly. Also, always be zeroing your caliper. One oh six. One oh six to the edge. Oh, hey, it's four hundred and four millimeters long. For head not found. I don't need. Just gonna make a cheeky little scribe mark there. Square these up. I wonder if I'm a fool for thinking the sides of this lumber are square. <laughs> Probably. I mean, 
trust but verify. <laughs> okay, so that's so done. That's, so then, then we do... should be able to take this, which yeah. I'm going to check again to see if it's drifted, because this is an incomplete tool. I mean, really, we're all incomplete tools. Okay, so that's still 22, and that is still seven. Great. So we'll just do a nice little. Millimeters worth, give or take. This is so cool that I made a tool and it is doing stuff. You're using a tool to make other things. That's it's deeply satisfying. Yeah. Once you realize that tools are just things made out of other things, and that you can, that there's nothing preventing you from making them yourself. When I was still uh, playing with the idea of getting into software development and finding out that within game houses there are people whose job it is to make tools there. Mm. Yeah, you often, you know, you, you do often, like the, the sort of tool chain of a particular software house can be yeah. a whole thing. Because it's, Adobe doesn't make a level designer. The, uh, for those of you who've never used one of these before, um, this little knob locks the uh, the tool. Mm -hmm. So when I get it to um, a measurement that I want, I can lock it and then it won't move. Which is important. It's very important. I'll also show you how unreasonably useful this is in just a second. I do I do like using the digital scribe to set the like old school. Uh, wooden scribe. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So there's three measurement um, oh, I love this about modes things. on the calipers. Or, so there's between these jaws. Mm -hmm. That's one. There's on the outside of these jaws. For measuring the inside of something. Yes. And then the secret one. Yeah, the, your, depth your depth gauge. gauge. Did you ever want to know how deep a screw hole is? Or Open something wide. like that? Uh, here, <laughs> check the ear. No, I don't think I'm going to do that because I was told that you should never put anything in your ear that's smaller than your elbow. I guess so, yeah. Well, that's what, I mean, that's what they so say. So we need bigger calipers is what you're saying. Um, other things to uh, you notice. You can measure exactly how big that is. This little wheel here, mm -hmm. which you can rotate to very slowly inc like move. The reed head. Ah, these are great. I should get a Mita to you at some point, <laughs> but maybe I haven't earned that. The one thing about this particular model of caliper too, uh, by the way, if you do get this model, uh, take the batteries out when you're not using it, if you're not going to use it for a few months, because these eat batteries. Even when they're not on. Yeah. But they, they I, the eponymous they have figured out how to use an ESP8266 to wire up to these calipers to make wireless digital calipers. Whoa. So you can just, you know, push Snap a button and one. put uh, put measurements into your CNC machine directly. Swank. That's like so gnarly. <laughs> so let's set this to this middle slot. Okay. And then let's not forget that one as yes. well. So that's 10. 10 width. And then 24 millimeters from the outside edge. These points for doing the scribing here are made out of music wire. Oh. It was actually hilarious. I have, um, when BC Shaver um, changed uh, locations, they liquidated a ton of their stuff, and I picked up like a grab bag of random like long stock odds and ends including like a bunch of brass pieces and random nonsense and I was looking for a piece of uh, steel wire that I could use um, 
for the triggering mechanism, which you'll find on one of the <laughs> last pages. And I was like, oh, sweet, a piece of wire. And then I tried cutting it. I was like, the saw is skimming off of this. I think this is hardened steel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, which was like, oh, OK, so this oh. is now useful in a completely different yeah. way. Um, so I had to cut it with um, my Dremel. And do I have edimentium wires? Yeah, or pretty much. Yeah. And and then um, I was able to use it to to make these little points by uh, sort of turning them um, in my in my drill and then like holding a grinding stone at an angle. It was kind of like wild. Can I make an ease of use situation uh, 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 adjustment for that uh, new tool? What are you thinking? Subscriber? I'm thinking. Make a very small dent, maybe even with the uh, the punch at the center point on the brass next to oh. those, and you can just put the points of your calipers into. Not for now. <laughs> no, that's that's a great idea. Uh, that's so, the other cool part, the cool part about making your own tools is you can modify them. Mm -hmm. well, you can modify tools that you bought as well. And yes, Princess and Dell, they do sell these calipers at Princess Auto. That's where my pair is from. Uh, yeah. This account, yeah, sixteen in the chat was mentioning that one of the things that separates a good quality pair of of uh, digital the calipers cool. versus the cheap ones is that uh, power drain thing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> also, like I guess there's like an extra couple little uh, circuits in there to cut off the power when it uh, if uh, you when it's not being used. Yeah, if you wanted to go like really really ham. Um, you can get manual read calipers. Mm, yes, please. Which I should probably get and start learning how to use. <laughs> because I have, uh, I didn't bring it, I think, at least I don't think I brought it. I have a micrometer, which oh. I'm, I'm trying to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's like, it looks like a little vice, kind of. And it's for measuring teeny tiny little distances. Oh, yeah, the, the, the infinitesimally small. Uh... It's very small, indeed. OK. So where do these go? OK, so, uh, 20 so that's 100 oh. plus 28 plus 16. Yep. Which works out to 244. Wait, I have a machine to do this. I can do math in my head, but this allows me to check my work on the fly. I cannot do math in my head. <laughs> in fact, I have trouble retaining a phone number on its way from reading it or hearing it to inputting it on my phone. Oh, no, I, I, I get that. I, I will close a tab and forget what tab I was going to open next. So, uh, 144. 144. Yes. Which is 14.4 centimeters. So on the, on the topic of uh, very small tools as well, uh, I, as you know, I've been 3D printing for a number of years now with the FDN stuff. And it's only recently that I've come across someone out there in the world of YouTube who uses feeler gauges. Oh, proper, baby. Proper feeler gauges to level and, and set the height of his print head. And I'm like, why are none of the rest of you out there doing this? Thank you one person for teaching me how to do this with 3D printers, but it's a, why are we using folded up pieces of paper? It's madness. Feeler gauges are so great. A feeler gauge, it's, um, it looks a little bit like a keychain almost. Yeah, it's a keychain. You know what, it looks like one of those like paint swatch things that you can It's just a out. series of yeah. thicker. Yeah, it's a series of, of infinitesimally incremented thicknesses of metal. Calibrated that you, Yeah, you can slide in there that it reminds me of my my favorite precision instrument the the um surface plate mm, yes. which is a Be block of table. granite that's really 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 flat certified flat mm. like engineers have verified how flat it is yeah. it's within this... like millionths of an inch for important places you have to bring people in to confirm that it is still flat there's there's a neat uh there's a video i saw on youtube a while ago that was some, was talking about the uh, this idea of uh, basically, measurement, precision in measurement uh, is like the 
the driver of uh, technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, that like it's every kind of a every big deal. basically every time we add an order of magnitude to being able to precisely measure stuff, that like sets off the next sort of industrial revolution yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of being able to like okay now we can make this whole new class of objects well, like or now we can use a whole new you know, now now lathes rather than just sort of roughly doing anything a lathe can now make a very precise thing yeah you know and and that kind of stuff like the yeah the um you know just just making a a piece of granite that's flat Turns out to because you need something to put your measurement material on. You need you need something to put your measuring device on that you know is flat, yep. so that you. <laughs> My mind was blown when I heard about gauge blocks. Ooh. Gauge blocks, which are precision ground little chunks of steel mm-hmm. that are exactly the size they say they are. Yep. And they're ground so precisely that they will stick together by an unknown phenomenon. Yeah. No one has figured out why they stick together. But they just like adhere if you like ring them together, they'll just stick. Yeah, they're they're like, they're the real life versions of those those samurai anime scenes where a guy chops whatever in half and sticks it together. um, That's EDM. (laughs) Uh, EDM machining where they use uh, uh, the electrified filament. Oh my gosh. It's so cool. I love videos of people putting this back inside. It's like some dude broke off a tap inside this like four hundred thousand dollar gearbox, and they have to extract it by using electricity to just, to just make abrade it away. at the molecular yep. level. <laughs> so that looks. Let's let's check our work. Yes. That is a 24. Correct. By 10. Uh-huh. Ish. Thereabouts. By 10. By 24. Thereabouts. Mm-hmm. So I think that's good. So then the last one we need to mark is this one. Yes. Those are. This little fuker. Blessfully 40 millimeters from the edge. Uh, and the hole is 16 long, and it is 28 millimeters from the edge of the, or from the side. I hope this wood behaves. <laughs> I'm gonna be so fucking sad if I have to do this again. Cause this is like the one piece of wood. I mean, it is the base, so we can probably, well, I don't know how much we can get away with. Uh, you know, this, this is, this is the base, everything is constructed from here. This is where we want things to be the most correct. It's true. This was a little hobby square that I got, and I am delighted to finally get to use it a little bit. I should probably pick one of those up myself, because right now the only square I have at home is a giant drywall T square. Yeah, this one's like, it's just so nice. It's and... the right size. <laughs> It's Square, not taking the table. Squares are one of those weird things where it, it's it's one of those tools that it's actually worth having a bunch of different sizes. Oh yeah. Within a kind of ridiculous range, like you can have a sort of medium one like this, and then like a little tiny one for <laughs> your model work, mm-hmm. and then like a big one for you know doing furniture or whatever. Um, let's see. Okay, I mean, so that was forty. I mean, if you want some good like geeking out about tool stuff. Those are 16 uh, wide. Uh, Adam Savage has uh, tested, oh, you know, he, yes. he, he often will do be like, you know, today I'm going to talk about why I have this giant pile of taps, <laughs> you know, why I need all of these or these, these 30 uh, different screwdrivers. <laughs> because As, screw Adam you. Savage is the perfect level of like, he, uh, you know, he, he's got that, like, uh, you know, obsessive geek mm-hmm. uh, aspect of, of, you know, wanting to, experimenting with things and wanting to get the best... Yeah, he loves stuff. ...thing and sort of liking physical objects. And also, he's, I, he's wealthy enough that he can yeah. get the right stuff <laughs> and is committed to, you know, getting that 
things. So he'll be like, this, you know, I've had 10 different things. This is my favorite whatever. This is the one to get. Well, that's exactly it. He's, he's one of those people that's been around the block enough times, and he's, he's established enough in his craft that he knows what his time is worth. And can say, right, like, right. Yeah, this, I, 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 I no longer need to suffer poor tools because I know that having a tool break in the middle of something is going to cost me this much time. He's also in this really weird spot um, for fabricators because like, he works in special effects, which is like the ultimate jack of all. Oh, yeah sort of sphere where you have to be able to do everything. And it's kind of funny because like sometimes on his videos when he's like doing stuff on the lathe, there'll be like actual machinists who's like, he's doing everything wrong. It's like, well, he's not a machinist, you yeah. see. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's doing stuff like, okay. <laughs> and all, I mean, I think also at this point, he's sort of, re he's sort of like not retired, but like. That's his own thing. Well, like messing around in his, uh, you know, in, in his shop mm -hmm. is kind of his job. <laughs> I, I think... Like he's not actually, he, the projects he's working on seem to be mostly just projects that interest him as opposed to like working for other people. I think what he's discovered, Paul, is something we've discovered a while ago is that you, if you're good at your hobbies, sometimes you can monetize them. <laughs> Where the hell did my third chisel go? Oh no. The third blue handle one. I, I saw you, you didn't eat it, I swear. I hope not. I didn't leave it at home, did I? No, I saw you take out three chisels uh, with blue handles. Huh, unless I'm gaslighting myself. No, it's very possible. Okay. Go we'll back have to go and, to the VOD. Yeah, yeah, go back and watch the VOD. Where did that third <laughs> chisel go? Roll it back. And just be like, there was no third chisel. All right, we got everything in place, though? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so I suppose I can like start working this out. Now let's see how we're supposed to cut a slot. To, to be honest, I think Where's you only book? tried to use two oh. chisels in order to like cut paper. So you may not have taken the third one out of the bag. Possible. Or it just maybe didn't show up. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it could be that it's still at home. <laughs> Also, I couldn't find my smallest chisel, which is a real bummer, because I probably need it. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've got one there that looks like it might be wide. So I have too wide. a small one. These ones are like weirdo shapes. That's the one I was. This was an. Oh, that's also an like an extra weirdo shape. Yeah. But maybe also it unhandled. Uh, it's fine. I'll just like. <laughs> I mean, speaking of you know making tools to make tools thing. The other thing I like about uh, test that you know I've said half the half his episodes are like not making an a a thing. It's making like I need to make a storage thing for all my mm -hmm. router bits. <laughs> So it's, you know, using the stuff to make a thing to make the stuff more useful. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much of the, uh, the maker space world is just about making storage for your other things that you're about to make. I definitely need to start doing that. Also, like, transparent bins. Ooh. So I'm realizing that um, I have that thing where th stuff that I set down disappears. So it has to be within my field of vision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that goes right to the bottom. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I think they all go all the way through. Yeah, the ones that I'm concerned about are the sort of tapered ones. They look like they're tapered. But I wonder if that's just the perspective too. Yeah, I don't know. I wish they'd give us more than just a... Uh, okay, so... I think the way I'm supposed to do this is saw cut and then chisel this off. That is an adorable little saw. Yeah, this is like a modeler saw. Like, I feel like you're halfway to just having like a full teeny weeny toolkit <laughs> of like the saw <laughs> and the hammer and... Yep. 
Yeah, we do have a vice if that would be helpful. That would be a great thing to do. We'll be right back. <laughs> uh, I also, I'll get my um, bigger saw set up because, like, this might work better for some stuff. I'm just going to deafen Paul here. Remember, when you deafen Paul, you also deafen everybody watching. I know, and then I pay for it. When you say, rip headphone users, I am also wearing headphones. <laughs> to do that. Easy, breezy, beautiful, clever girl. Need to make some boots. Co uh, cover girl's uh, line of uh, Japanese woodworking tools. <laughs> Doesn't get a lot of uh, advertisement, but it's like surprisingly good. And then here's a little booty you can use to uh, booty! grip the things with. I'll have to cut it down later, but... I mean, I could probably cut this. Oh, probably. Um, I'm just trying to think how to get this on the jaws. My thought would be, if I may, yeah, uh, just open those suckers up, the jaws, and just wrap it around thusly. Yeah, all right. Oh. See, I figured that I should have brought clamps. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Let me hold that steady for you. This is a good idea. Oh, there we go. If you've never used a Japanese style pull cut saw, they are you're lovely. missing out. Hang on. Oh, yeah. There we go. Just gotta see where. Ah, uh, there's my mark. Thank you, Ian. I think, yeah, that's got it. So now the second one. The shot makes it look like you're a lot closer to my hands than you are. <laughs> that is funny. Okay, and you want to uh, can I just chisel it out from there, or do you want to put some more uh, Let's, uh... cuts in? Oh, wow. That just goes right through, doesn't it? Sharp chisels. We'll do this in like smaller pieces. Or, or, or <laughs> fuck it. You know, just fuck it. I've never used a chisel for its uh, intended use, but really. Wait, what are you? What have you been using chisels for? <laughs> yeah, you know, toenail cutting, that kind That's of stuff. Scraping something. Uh, we can tidy that up later, I guess. Maybe actually. How sharp should your chisels be? Yes. That seems nice. That looks nice. Cheeky little slot there. Then we'll get the next one. Ah, the markings on the other side. That's okay. Oh, you can flip these. Actually, yeah. Let me just. I. If there isn't already, I feel like there could really be a market for uh, woodworking ASMR. <laughs> like, I mean, I guess you could watch any of the woodworking channels and get ASMR. Hello, <laughs> hello, everybody, and welcome to my woodworking uh, project. I'm just 
just going to slowly saw into this, <laughs> into this <laughs> piece of, of oak. All right, here we go. And like they have like one of you know one of those uh, the head the headphones with like you know the the, the <laughs> yep. microphones that are, have like the ears on them so you can get like the good stereo shot. Mm -hmm. I'm just imagining. Oh, wait, and then it's just it's just, okay. Ian, you, I'm an here idiot. We go. Yeah. We'll just put it in this way. Yep. <laughs> I'll just reframe that shot. I can imagine Paul seeing a uh, just one of those heads in close up, and then a, a Japanese saw coming in and cutting the ear off. Uh, it's like ASMR, but also body horror. We aim to please. So I I th I feel like woodworking is one eighth inch uh, precision or like tolerance yeah. is what I heard. Yeah, I mean, I guess with woodworking, there's a limit to your, like there's a limit to how precise you can get. Just yeah, you because, just can't. Because wood expands and contracts. And well, that's what I was talking about earlier with the uh, the curved compensation too. But you know, we're, we're trying to be as accurate as possible. Because oh, yeah. we're craftspeople. Yeah, not like with uh, metalworking where you can be within thousandths of an inch, <laughs> which is a standard that somebody decided on using. Yeah. Oh well, what can you do? <laughs> can we metricize imperial somehow? Oh. No! Because my freedom. Uh, if I could get you to hold this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to come around uh, the other side here so you don't end up chiseling directly into my... I mean, the, the biggest problem is that the, uh, as we found out in various ways on Tinker Tailor Solder Fry, like when you were uh, putting together the, um, the uh, steering wheel, mm -hmm. it, like metric versus imperial wouldn't be such an issue if they weren't slightly off from each other. <clears throat> So they're, they are incompatible in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, take off a half inch. You mean a centimeter? No! I will say that I'm glad this project is starting to familiarize me with how big certain metric distances are. Because mm -hmm. that was one of the reasons that I, I did, I do, do still do a lot of Imperial measurements is I just have no idea how big umpteen number of centimeters is. Mm. Oh, this got really fucking weird in a hurry. I mean, that's. I mean, there is stuff that you sort of internalize. Like everybody knows how big an inch is. It was only last year when I finally figured out uh, how to shorthand the the fractions of inches. What? I never understood how to, uh, or I never put the time into learning how to look at a ruler and see the, the tick marks and the, what they meant about oh. which one was the eighth mark, which one was the 16th mark, which one was et cetera, et cetera. Because that's my favorite thing about metric is that it's it's just decimals, man. Just say, th say what you mean. Decimals, man. And so then you get you, you get those two op opposite sides of the argument. It's like, oh yeah, no, it's, it's all decimals. It's super easy to, uh, to write down what you mean. Oh yeah, it's all just, it's all uh, fractions. It's super, uh, super clean. No, it's not. But of course the problem is- Oh, hey, here's what we can- okay. If we did all, won't, if, if and when people switch to metric, it invalidates all the, like, the tools that everyone has. Yeah. Oh, good. So yeah. nobody wants to do it. It's not a, not a perfect slot, but it's going to be covered up by stuff. Oh, my. We have made. Sluts! Hurrah! You are sluts! First slot. Do you in. remember that time in, when Conan punches out a camel? <laughs> He's like, you are sluts. I am familiar with that. I will have to look that up, I guess. Yeah, he gets loaded and punches out a camel. And I don't know if so, it was a stunt camel. I, <laughs> I... I initially thought you were talking about, like, Conan. Right! Not, not Conan. That's why I was confused. Okay. I was that, like, that, that was would... that was a bit. Of, I mean, I could see Conan doing that yeah, on his show, just Conan as like a weird thing to do. Campbell is absolutely a segment he would do. 
Okay, yeah, so we have um, maybe a problem. Ooh. I don't have a chisel thin enough for these slots. Ooh. Well, what I'm going to suggest here is that uh, it's probably a good time for us to take a short break. That's a great idea. We should do. So we're going to get up, stretch our legs, think about what we need to do, and uh, Tell we'll be me, back I had, with... a, I had a short one, like a, a thin one, but I don't know where it is. Like, let's take a commercial break, and maybe when we come back, the problem will be solved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Find out in a few minutes. Don't go all the way away. Welcome back to Tinker Taylor Solder Fry while we are putting together a one-fifth scale guillotine. <laughs> Chop them up. We've made some holes. It's... Yeah, we made, we made some holes. We're going to make some more holes. So we we're just conferring about where to go next. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to cut these uh, slots, but not these ones yet. Mm -hmm because they're a little peculiar. See, because how this is going to go together is those will sit there, and then these crossbars will be like that. So these slots are actually, like, triangular, and we don't know exactly how triangular until I think we get these cut, which will probably make figuring out that taper easier. Yeah, the dowels so. are going to be what's actually providing the uh, most support. Mm -hmm. But I think having it properly tapered is not a bad idea. Yeah. So I was thinking, because we don't have a chisel that's like narrow mm. enough for this slot, but I got a bunch of drills. Hmm. So I can at least like get a start on it. Start on We it? can just sort of start bodging out material. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm game for that. So then, did you say you had uh, some files? I don't actually know if I brought files. Uh oh. I might have one or two because I'm just like prepared for everything. I kind of wish I brought my coping saw. My coping saw, which implies the existence of a molding saw <laughs> and a seething saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. This is a tough situation. Frankly, the only way I can cope is the saw. Oh, nothing to worry about there. Oh, we've reached the, the pliable board meat below. <laughs> I was just looking at them like, mm, yeah, you know what, that bit is not longer than those sticks or the and the board combined, so you're good. Uh, and this, folks, is why we're doing this on, on not a our really nice table. table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My so, trick whenever I'm doing this sort of thing and I'm worried about going too deep is always to put a little bit oh, of you know uh, what? gaff tape over the edge of the drill bit. Let me just, you know what, I'm going to try something. I do have a corner chisel. Oh. I mean, I mean that'll get the four, corners. <laughs> four, four, four corners. Definitely feeling like I might end up trying to redo this off stream in hardwood. <laughs> now that you've, uh... but you know, we're still we're still learning. Well, this that, it's it's a let's try program, Alex. It we, is. We are trying, and we it's are like, learning. Oh, we fucked up. That didn't work. You're still not totally sure what kind of wood this is. Yeah, I think it's cedar, which would be why it's so soft. Wouldn't cedar be a hardwood? Nope. Oh, no. Cedar's a soft very, wood. Very, very soft. Well, but soft and hardwood don't actually have any relationship to their softness or hardness. Really? Yes. Wait, what? Yeah. Since Bal when? Balsa wood is a hardwood. What? Really? That's... <laughs> soft wood is, is wood from, like, fruit trees and stuff. Get those filthy lies out of my ears. Ugh. Hardwood is... Uh, yeah. Ah, it's all about <laughs> how long it takes to grow. That's yeah. messed up. Huh. Which, it, it, in the sense of like when, when uh, for instance, you hear on the news like softwood lumber, yes, whatever. <laughs> They're the legal designation of the different things. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're building something, then 
the 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 hardness of the wood is the important thing, not the legal designation of the wood. But Spawnapaster says soft woods are conifers, so there we so cedar would in fact then be a soft wood. Oh, wood. Okay. Whereas hardwoods are. Oh, I I did it the wrong way around. Ah. Fruiting trees are are the hardwoods. Are hardwoods. Okay. Right. That 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 matches up with my experience then. But it doesn't have to do with the, the hardness of the wood itself. Yeah. But it uh, can. On average, I believe hardwoods tend to be harder than softwoods, <laughs> but that isn't actually part of the definition. <laughs> That's freaking wild. <sighs> Why do we even have words sometimes? I mean, you can just say English. <laughs> have a soft drink. Is there alcohol in it? Of course. What? No. How do we do it in there? Slow but steady. Camera here. Oh, yep. That's just Mr. Onion Knight. Oh, you mean my shirt? Yes. <laughs> Maybe I can just. Haha. Uh -huh. Yeah, once you get in there, you should be able to scoop things. I'm also being like very shy about. Wouldn't like doing a bunch of holes with the drill be helpful? It depends how you. He's try not. And he's actually out. not wrong. I'll do that for the second one. Let's try doing this one the dumb way. <laughs> The sort of slow and steady way. And then we'll try that for the second one. Actually, now that I've got a free piece here, I can really like just, get in just there. huff that. Yeah, I think that's cedar. Yeah, oh yeah, there it is now. Whereas oak doesn't really smell too much like stuff. No. It's just kind of there. It's like, I'm wood. We had a uh, cherry tree just outside my uh, place get chopped down. Actually, Ian. Yes. If you would, oh boy. If you would like to do a thing. Oh, absolutely. This stack of feet. Mm hmm. Feet need to be sanded. Ah, well, I just can like do that. Uh, 120 is probably plenty. It's okay. Because okay. like they just need to have their rough edges. Oh, 220. No. Okay. Uh, I cannot. I cannot see the feet. Please, please. They're please very show. teeny tiny. Please show feet. Oh my <laughs> God, Paul. <sighs> and people type my name in all caps. <laughs> As Heather said, if you can get the chat to say your name, you're winning. So I haven't put too much thought into what the finish is going to be on this. Because apparently the original guillotines uh, were painted red. So you wouldn't be able to see yeah. the blood so much. Yeah, I, I would think uh, something uh, easily washable. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would personally just go with mineral oil and let that uh, let the color of the, the oak wood is such sing. a pretty pretty wood. But I'm a little bit biased. Please remove material. Man, I have a long way to go. All right, you know what, let's use technology. <laughs> I'm 
bit of the... Not quite happy with that yet. A little bit more on the edges. Don't have my glass surface to sand on though, so... Said, I mean, it might be fun to uh, anodize the blade in a rainbow. Ooh. I've actually done anodizing. Oh, for, have you? Yeah, for aluminum. Mm -hmm. It's very cool and quite difficult to get really consistent, good results. It's something I'm, I'm looking to play with in the future. Uh, we should talk because uh, I have done it. Excellent. So, I mean, you'll have to supply the sulfuric acid, though. Okay. Maybe we're using different, uh, different strat... No, wait, it's electroplating that I was looking into. Right. Just different from anodizing. Yeah. But only slightly. Don't you hate when you show up at, like, board game night, and you're like, I brought the sulfuric acid, what? <laughs> oh, I misunderstood what we were doing tonight. Oh, no, awkwardness. It's like, has this happened to you? Why? Why did it happen to you? Why did you let this like, happen? Like, how did that even ha how did, how did you arrive at the circumstances that permitted that to occur? Master asks if I've etched my own PCB boards. Seems like a thing you do. Not yet. But we'll, uh, we'll call that something that's going to come up Ian, at some point in the future. <laughs> this might be of, of interest to you. Did you know that the, there's an ongoing project at Makerspace right now where they're building a, or at least like configuring a automatic pick and place machine? Uh, hello. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's cool. I always get excited to see people who uh, make their own pick and place machines and then use them as a. Uh, the basis for a magic card sorting system. Oh my god. I thought you were going to say pick and place and like have it as a like tapas serving machine. <laughs> you just like lie down underneath it and it like puts canapes in your mouth. Very quickly too. It's like world record breaking um, omakase. <laughs> Actually speaking of which, I only recently found out that uh, NHK World has their own website and streaming a lot of NHK content. Oh, yeah. Including um, a program I was looking at that uh, went over the history of the making of the first sushi making robot. Sushi robot. <laughs> That's pretty cool. What went into the, uh, the whole aspect of uh, the technology necessary to press the rice correctly. Turns out you just needed a lot of uh, silicone to mimic a, f a hand, but... Which I'm sure they got from uh, industries that market their products on J-List. <laughs> That's about the, the like ceiling of how risky I can get with dumb jokes on this stream. Is J-List? <laughs> it's like, haha, J-List! I mean, fine purveyor of manga! And... Chachkis. I, I, I am known to and uh, occasionally converse with the preeminent teledildonics uh, person on Twitter. Not something we're going to show off on, on uh, of course this not. stream, but... I mean, as long as we're being a little bit blue... Can I just say that, like, all fucking robots look terrible? They're so un aesthetically unappealing, yes. I think that might be... A, a, an eventual project of mine <laughs> that makes them look less industrial and more aesthetic. To make an attractive android. Because it really does look like something on an assembly line. <laughs> oh god, this is such a hack job. Oh well. And me without a chisel. Nyang. I'm pretty sure Astro Boy would have made a very different... Uh 
story if Professor Bolt The machine guns come out of his hips, okay? His <laughs> hips. <laughs> it says so in the ephemera. <laughs> Actually, that's a project I'm in the middle of uh, just doing research for, trying to find a good frame of the 80s Astro Boy, uh, his atomic cell that he keeps in his chest. You should talk to my dad. Yeah. He's probably got the reference material. It's very possible. He did do Astro Boy comics in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I should definitely bring my files and stuff next time. Oh, it's clean out the inside? A little bit. Oh, there's your problem. <laughs> like, it's square. Yep. It ain't pretty. Well, that's nice. I mean, we do seem like those types of, uh, of, of makers who do uh, paint the back of our <laughs> cabinets. <laughs> Yes, no one's going to see it, but that doesn't matter. We all know it's there. And it'll torment us for the, to the end of our days. But that said, you know, that's going to be the inside of the hole. No one's going to see that, ideally. Yeah, I might have to finesse that later. I haven't sanded wood since the last time I built my own shelves. Really? Yeah, I get those snow. It's refreshing to not have to, well, not have to wear PPE while sanding. You should always wear PPE while sanding, kids. Well, I mean, like, serious sanding. Yeah. And sanding anything toxic. Yes, if you're sanding anything resin-based, absolutely put a mask over your face. Oh, right, yeah, resin's no good. Right. Yep. Yeah, remember what Pete, you were saying about lead earlier? Resin is like that, but for real. <laughs> like, don't huff it. Yep, don't huff it, don't let it get on your skin, don't let it get into your skin. Like the dry powder? Oh, no, the, the, the liquid. Ah, yeah. yeah uncured liquid. You want to use gloves for that. Oh yeah. And specifically nitrile gloves because it'll eat through latex. That's always scary. Yeah. Yeah when I found out for various things that the you know handling acetone etc. You want a very specific type of gloves. Acetone freaks me out because it's it feels cold. Oh because it evaporates so quickly. Oh yeah, I've I, I've thankfully never gotten to the stage of touching acetone with my bare hands. Oh no no, through the gloves. Oh okay. Like it just it it feels like cool to the touch. It's uh, acetone is one of those products I only haul out on occasion when there's something really really gnarly you need to clean mm -hmm. that just like turns its nose up at all other cleaners. It's like, okay, I wasn't asking. You need to come off now. I'm the cleaner. Dirty. Dirty. Boop, boop, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, boop, 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 Clap the blocks and... We clap some blocks tonight, lads. Get a dusting. Ooh. Okay, oak, oak does make a nice smell when it's been sanded. Well, I have good news for you. <laughs> There's more to sand? Uh, generally oh, speaking, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many of these pieces will need, like, sanding. I don't want to, like, get into that prematurely. Oh, that's fine. There's always... It, well, it's woodworking. There's always sanding to be done. Yeah. You've got time to stand. You've, You've got, got time, time to, to sand. sand. Paul, we have time for crab, right? 
Uh, I believe there's always time for craft. If you've got time to gab, you've got time for craft. It usually comes down to money being the issue. I've always got time for crap. Money's usually just a little bit tight for it. Is that why they made artificial crap? Mmm. Pollock rolls. It's made out of like whitefish or something, isn't it? Yeah. Ah! The yeah. Leatherman. Yeah, it's... it's the it reason I bring job. this is that it'll solve any problem. Kind of okay. This hole is just getting uglier and uglier. I was recently talking with an acquaintance who'd hacked their own Leatherman to remove one of the knife blades and replace it with a scalpel holder. Mm -hmm. They had to cast it themselves. That's but... pretty cool. I actually quite like artificial crab. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really taste like crab. Like, it's a whole different oh, yeah. thing. But it's, it can be quite tasty. It, it has its own taste, and it's quite nice. I feel just, I just feel kind of bad for, I guess it's like pollock or mm -hmm. I, whatever the fish is that gets turned into artificial crab. Nobody ever gets to actually... I have no what, identity. Yeah, whatever that fish actually is. Actually, the pollock is probably like, stop eating me. <laughs> Does the pollock come in tube form? Or is it... No, it's, I know it's rolled up. Fun, f not think fun fact. The last time I made uh, California rolls on Tinker Taylor, I uh, ended up using uh, canned crab as opposed to the imitation stuff. And honestly, are you sure it wasn't opium? <laughs> oh I yeah, mean, getting those Tintin references in here. <laughs> wow. Oh wow, the blue crab. But yeah, it, 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 it didn't taste like what I remembered uh, California rolls tasting like the last time. Like, I don't think California rolls are even supposed to be made with Rio crab. <laughs> I, I think may, maybe fancy ones, but uh, honestly, having done it myself, I wouldn't. It would be sort of like Spam Musubi with gold flakes on. Oh, God. <laughs> like a Spam Musubi with, uh, with, with just slices of beef instead of the, uh, the Spam. Wouldn't that be slices of pork? I, I guess so, yeah. Spammy is made out of pork, right? Hey, sure, probably. Among other things. Like, I, I believe it's SP to ham. Intern so camp detainees. Yeah. <laughs> spiced, spiced ham. Oh, yes, that's what the, the SP is there for. Spice. Maybe, may, may, maybe imitation crab is secretly being run, you know, secretly being promoted by, like, the crab... Uh, like the crabs themselves, like mm. being like, yeah, imitation crab. It's much better than uh, actual crabs and cheaper too. You should you should try it. <laughs> it I mean, it was uh, it was well into my life before I discovered what the imitation crab was trying to mimic in its, uh, I guess, natural state. Mm. And that, yeah, you, you, if, if, if if you make enough money, boys and girls, you too can buy crab legs that have that much meat in them. Yeah. That's true. It's very, it's very un uncommon for you to actually have like a chunk of crab, mm -hmm. like a flank <laughs> of crab, like you can get with imitation crab. Well, I mean, a, a crab pot roast. I mean, even the crab, uh, the canned crab I was using, states on the can, 100% crab, 16% chunk meat. I believe that the majority of the meat uh, comes from like the, the the shell section rather than the legs, and so it's just that it's scooped out or maybe just blown out with air. I, I don't know how they do the crab processing. Chunk meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, one of the problems with this being soft wood is that it just doesn't carve very well either. Yeah. It just sort of like rips apart. But we have two poles. Yep. And so we can. Oh, those are ugly. Oof. Oh well, they'll they'll do for now. We're gonna we put can that aside. In there. So, what's the next piece? Ooh. Oh dear God. Next piece are the uprights. This should be exciting. And so now we actually get to work with oak. So we'll see how this behaves. And let us resume our <laughs> precise 
measure rosity. Holy freaking shit balls. Okay. This so is complicated. What do you want to do first? Um These are square, right? Yes. Yes, they're four by four, so. Or at least they Why don't we be. how about we maybe just do the like base slots so that we can get the upper. Yeah, let's in. do these and see if we what we can do about yeah. that. So eight by ten by eight. I think we can set that. I think that's doable. I think this might already still be set to ten. Uh, now you're saying that this this guillotine, uh, which is the f one of one of if not the first guillotine that's known to have been actually created, mm -hmm. yes, was made by a cabinet maker, right? A uh, harpsichord maker. Harpsichord maker. <laughs> I love that. I wonder. I wonder if there's like if if some of the aspects of the construction are like more complicated or different than they should than they needed to be because he was like well this is how you build this thing it's like what well, yeah but we, we don't need to make a we don't need to put strings on it though some weird <laughs> shared genetics between harpsichords and guillotines look if you don't attach it with the dowels you're not going to get the resonance yeah do we need the resonance no <laughs> It is. It's like it's just, that's how we know how to make a thing. <laughs> when you, because he didn't actually invent the thing, right? He just he he followed the plans that were. Give, what like wasn't there? Wasn't it actually like, whatever, somebody guillotine? Or? I, I think you're right. Yes. I, yeah. The last time I read a scholarly paper on the, the guillotine was back in, in high school when I was a scholar and I found it in the social studies classroom. It wasn't a good paper, but guillotine was a man-eating machine. And that's, that's the main takeaway. But yeah, it was, it was supposed to be a humane method of, uh, of execution. Which has been the, the subject of some controversy, I think, because it's whether or not there's any fact in the head remaining conscious after removal thing. Blink once for yes, twice for no. Which I don't know if they've ever like conclusively proved that one way or the other. Mm. It it is a it's a tough one to test. Yeah, <laughs> ethically difficult to get the funding yeah. for that uh, trial. I think they, uh, I, th I think they've, they've 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 theoretically proven it is possible. But... I mean, also I think it would be difficult to prove what you were experiencing at that time. Yeah. Oh, Apart from like, oh, how about that? So I don't know. At least according to chat, uh, this harpsichord maker made the guillotine. Oh really? Uh, and then um, Doctor Guillotine, he just made the thing. And he's like, hey, I've made a really interesting new type of harpsichord. <laughs> <laughs> and then this guy, and then the guy, uh, Doctor Guillotine was like, "Hey, this French Revolution, we should start using this guy's thing instead of the." And so he like popularized it. Ah, uh, <laughs> that inventor and popular. So it goes. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, obviously humane in the context of execution is relative, but oh, it's better than some things like the electric chair or gas chamber. Mm -hmm. It's like if you if you give me those pick, it's like slice my head off, man. Let's go. Make it quick. Make it quick. Yeah. See the play. It really has to suck to be one of one of those situations where you are the inventor but not the popularizer. Mm. 
the, the one that's coming to mind immediately is uh, is Nukemin and Watt. These reposters always get the credit. Yeah, yeah. that's how it goes. James Watt did nothing. It was all Nukemin. To be fair, though, Watt is a better name it's for a unit. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot easier to spell. Let me tell you that. <laughs> Ooh. What? Sound against the, uh... Oh no, that's just the, uh, just the saw itself. Because again, hard wood. Did you want the vice? Uh... I think I might be okay. Okay. Try to get a dozen feet by next time. Two weeks. Okay, maybe I do need the vice. Tinker Taylor, solder fry, always promoting vice. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. That's better. Yes. I think I'm going to be a little conservative about, about oh, that. Really. What? <laughs> you could spin it around the other way. No, too. no, no. I, markings are here. Ah. footage of Alex. <laughs> we should probably consider bolting this. Too. Yeah. Maybe I should bring my vice next time because it has, it's attached to a wooden base that can be clamped to the table. This one mainly is an anvil for for uh, metal working or leather working. <laughs> okay, so now ah, fresh chisel. Oops. Wait, you have a third chisel. No, but it, not one with the blue handle. The, one, oh, okay. the, the third one I was looking for is smaller than this one. Actually, maybe, maybe for ease of camera, I can go like this. Oi. So this is making the, uh, the thing that will fit into the... Yeah, the slot, which I hope I have not our stuff already. It looks, it looks good to me. I'm just gonna take a little. What what's the woodworking term for there? There's the the for the the sticky bit that goes into the slot. Oh, the tongue. The tongue? Or is that the tenon? Yeah, yes. the mortise and tenon. The, yes. Right. Yeah, which one's the mortise and which one's the tenon? Ten. Thank you, Viscount sixteen. Uh, the mortise is the hole. The tenon is the stick. Calling it the sticky in bit will uh, immediately out you. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, you're not a woodworker at all. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we should adapt those terms to all sorts of uh, computer use as well. Do you use, use the use tenon? Yeah, just stick, just stick the USB uh, t tenon in the USB <laughs> mortise.
I usually crimp my own Ethernet cables, but I ran out of tenons. the book mm -hmm. um oh the book carving these because i think i looked it up and i think i'm doing this correctly i hope that's what i what you're doing looks correct to me but i'm going to approach it very slowly I'm never sure what orientation the um, chisel is supposed to be in because a lot of times when you're cutting, it's supposed to be inverted. 46. You should just use a saw for this part. <laughs> but, well, I want you to use a doweling jig. What? What are you even talking about here? You crazy? So yeah, they were suggesting uh, you were doing correct there to uh, drill out the holes and then oh, get well, a chisel in there. Okay, good. I haven't gone past the point of no return. <laughs> hey, nice. I definitely need to try and get a Dozuki for next time. Henry um, wants an ISBN for the book. Uh, as soon as Alex gets this piece off, I will hold the ISBN number up. Get ready. chisel is the correct move there, but you probably want to use that, do that on a flat surface. Yeah. Anyway, there's your ISBN number. Away! Oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to come in on the other side for a little bit and then maybe meet up in the center. Yeah, this is just going to bounce. Working, we will go. Definitely working with the grain there. I, f I think that when I was making this lumber, I had to use my arch nemesis, the table saw. Ah. Uh. Table saws scare the shit out of me. Really? Yeah. I mean, like it's it's kind of a a a respectful fear, mm -hmm. but. They're just one of the most intimidating machines in the wood shop. So everyone I know who does woodwork uh, semi-professionally, mm -hmm. or even just a, is serious about the hobby, uh, definitely has a staw sop or a, a staw saw, oh, saw stop. stop. Yeah, uh, the version. electronic one. Yeah, those are pretty cool. We don't have one of those. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> if we did, it would have it would get broken in like five seconds. Yeah, because makerspace. It's where, it's where good tools go to die. 
But I mean, if you, if you put together a good fence and a uh... yeah, like we have all the all the tools. Like we have push sticks and um, like guards and that sort of stuff. But it's just like it's a it, it's a frightening device. It's it's absolutely one of those things that you do not let your attention wander for even a second. Okay. <laughs> that could have been disastrous. A uh, good advice from Captain Obese is to go a little bit deeper on your stop cuts at the end first. Oh. That'll, help, that'll help with the tear out there. For those actual woodworkers out there, I hope this isn't too cringe. <laughs> I get the feeling that anyone who's actually woodworking out a woodworker out there is just happy to actually see this on the program. I'm just gonna like fastidiously measure and yeah. remeasure and then remeasure again. That's how you do it right. Okay, so that's down to eleven. So we need to take like one ish off both sides, I guess. Get thee hence. Oh, that's the beauty of a good, good sharp chisel. Okay. It's not so bad. It's a little low on that side. Getting this to go even is going to be the fun part. here, I think. Yeah. It's making me wonder if we've got any C-clamps in the, in my box. That I, can... I thought you were going to say C-clamps in the C. <laughs> <laughs> okay, clean up on the other side. Actually, in the interest of what was mentioned before. Daniel Joel would like to know if there's any big reason for the guillotine other than it's just that time for the revolution already. I mean, I think the answer's in the question. Can you think of a better time in current year to be building uh, a symbolic <laughs> machine? Mm -hmm. I mean, for eviscerating wealthy people. I mean, let's be honest, the best time for a guillotine, to build a guillotine was 2016. The second best time is now. Yeah. I do have plans to eventually build some like straw effigies mm -hmm. that we can feed into this thing. <laughs> you know, ones with like three-piece suits. Oh, yeah. Maybe a kind of ruddy complexion, a tangled shock of like lemonade yellow hair. Oh, just tear. Or in addition to the three-piece suits, can we add in the uh, a few with uh, just sport coats on top of uh, t-shirts? Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> so, but this is your first big uh, woodworking project. Oh yeah, I don't even remember what the last thing I tried to work of, out of wood was. <laughs> what? I'm concerned that Ian is, sounds like he wants to guillotine the uh, hosts of uh, Checkpoint. <laughs> oh no, they're doing it ironically, I hope. The T-shirt and sport coat. Yeah, look. <laughs> it's 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 the the, the tech CEO uh, 
and, and also all the uh, video game developers uh, who are presenting things at uh, conventions. Oh, absolutely, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Are you getting a bit to just the... yeah? Let's just gotta lower this side a bit. Still a bit of a keystone there. Hmm. I guess woodworking is a little bit art and science. I feel like this is a craft I could probably uh, get a lot more into, given time. Well, it's definitely one of the uh, the more practical uh, hobbies. I watched um, a video about a traditional cooper, and it was. Fascinating. Ooh. Coopers make buckets. Yep. And that's all they do. And making a bucket is really Bar something. Barrels and stuff too, right? Oh, do they? Yeah. Well, in that case, ba yeah, bandage. I guess so. Ba right, because they would have the tools for it. And, I mean, a barrel is just sort of two buckets, one on top of each other, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that's not how the recipe looks in Minecraft, but. <laughs> Could I have some of that 120? Yes. <laughs> a bucket is just a barrel with like the top cut off. Basically. <laughs> I feel like barrels used to be a lot easier to get. Well, like, what do you need a barrel for? You can now, I think, maybe get them in certain gardening stores as, like, quirky, sort of, like, well, that was what put they, in place things. Like, that was what they, that, what they used to do back in the, uh, the, back in the 80s. You used to go and buy wooden barrels that used to be uh, swish barrels for the alcohol industry. But uh, you'd use them for rain barrels or for uh, chopped in half as planters. Yeah, unfortunately, that disposable type barrels are like just big, like plastic tubs. Oh, now. they are now. Yeah. 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 So, like all of all of the like you know nice wooden barrels. Uh, I think they are, stay are... within the alcohol industry now. Well, yeah, everything is like you know whatever. Uh, wine or uh, uh, barrel aged mm -hmm. in barrels that were used for X, Y, and Z. Even the, almost. Even good beers too. I think that this is a good, a good tenon. Mortis. I, that's the tenon. Yes, the tenon. Tenon. <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've got a mnemonic in my head now uh, for for the uh, for the same way I remember soup, same A and uke. Um, do we want to, I think we should do the other one. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So I'm gonna put this. Meow. That. It's there's parts of it are quite uneven, unfortunately. Oh, a little bit. Again, this is a uh, no one's good at you looking let's, at. Let's this attempt. Part. I mean, sure, this guillotine is a little, a uh, little rustic, but hey, I haven't heard any complaints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are the exit surveys like? <laughs> Oof. Is this your first time guillotining with us before? Well, we do things a little bit differently here. Ours is more of, more of a like funky vibe. <laughs> We ask, you know, patrons to sort of, you know, get into it, you know, cut loose. We serve tapas, like, they're small dishes. It's a surplus of barrels because bourbon needs to be aged on new barrels, but the Scotch manufacturers found out that the barrels that have already been used for bourbon aging are better than unused barrels. Yeah, uh, they, they, I feel yeah, like there, there's property. a whole like barrel pipeline now. It's like yeah. you know, a barrel will start in one place, and then you'll have like 
bourbon aged scotch and then you'll have like scotch aged wine and then you'll have you know wine aged something <laughs> one of my favorite beers uh, over the summer was a uh, was a barrel aged beer from category 12 mm. and uh, again they, they were not fresh barrels they were old uh, whiskey barrels of some form but who knows where they came from on the island and it's there's not a lot of uh there are not many um manufactured products where you can like advertise like we did not wash this before yeah. we used it <laughs> <laughs> well but that was that was half of the the appeal for the kids during the 70s and 80s when those things were on the market was you'd you'd get a peach schnapps aging barrel and then you'd get a little bit of residue still on the inside but then you'd pour in some uh, boiling water and swish the whole barrel around and get drunk off of Whatever came leached out of the wood. Not very good. This sounds faintly similar to what they used to do at parties back in my dad's day, where um, they would put a garbage can at the front door, mm -hmm. and anything anybody brought just went in the garbage. Oh pan. no! Yeah, it was called Purple Jesus Punch. Whew. Purple Jesus. Punch. So you can imagine nowadays it would just be like I don't know. It's like wine coolers, white claw, yeah. whiskey, four loco. I think they're bringing that back for some reason. Kombucha. Oh, God. Rejoice. A so six pack of like Coke Zero. <laughs> Red Bull, yes, lots of Red Bull. Pimiento did it back in the day, but it ended up green because of all the Midori. Well, that, that, that dates you right there. Midori. Would have been the chartreuse back an hour. That was when I feel like that was when like ja uh, Japan was still like kind of chic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was they, they were just out of the nineties. Yeah, like there was a period when uh, memory of the war had faded enough that like Japanese culture started like becoming popular mm -hmm. in the West. Well, and they they were they were safe because they were no longer trying to to purchase it. The racism has an arc to it and. North America. It does. I suppose weeaboos fit in there somewhere. Oh yeah. I mean, they f yeah. They always fit in somewhere. But uh, I was watching um, quite a quite an interesting, like sort of underrated movie, um, Mosquito Coast with um, Harrison Ford and there's like this pretty racist opening sequence where he's like talking shit about ma like products made in Japan because um, in the like 70s and 80s Japanese products are were then what made in China and Malaysia products are now yes, yes. they were like very poor quality you know imports I mean, of course, we're at the point now where, like, made in China. Made in China can mean anything. Yeah. Like, everything is made yeah, in China. Exactly. So it's not really, it's not really an indication of quality one way or another, really. The thing that I heard about the Chinese manufacturing industry is that they will build things exactly to the spec they're requested. So if, like, um, a company is like, we want a bunch of these widgets and we want them as cheap and dirty as possible. Mm -hmm. They're like, yep, we'll do that. And then if they're like, we need these like spaceship parts and they have to be really good, they'll be like, yeah, we'll do that too. Well, they spent the last 40 years becoming the manufacturing center. Like, I guess the, the way you do that is by doing what people want exactly. I mean, of course, the other trick is that they'll make you some incredibly amazing spaceship parts. And then be like, and now that we know how to make spaceship parts, yep, and we know where we can shave some money off the spaceship <laughs> parts. Gosh darn it! I mean, you always see that with like Kickstarters, uh, where people get in over their heads oh. on like, we'll get this thing manufactured, and then it's like, you know, if you don't literally have somebody living in China like who knows the industry and knows how to deal 
uh, with the various uh, Chinese manufacturers, you very rapidly... I feel like there's probably a whole Chinese industry of, you know, taking... Not taking advantage, but sort of... Uh, Being there to catch... De dealing with people making Kickstarters who don't really know what they're doing. Never <laughs> promise physical goods. Well, unless your thing is a physical well, good. Yes. But it'll be always like, it's like, we'll make this thing. And like, you know, we made a pr this prototype and it totally works. And we know how we'll make 50 of them. And then they, they sell, you know, 5,000. And they're like, okay, well, now we have to set up Chinese manufacturing. Yep. And then you never hear from them again. Th this is, you are quoting from an email that is sitting in my inbox right now from a, uh, uh, not, not a Kickstarter, but a, a pre-ordered uh, manufactured thermometer. And they're, they're, the, the, the body of the email is essentially, so yeah, we've, we've made them, we prototyped them, we ran some small runs, and it was all great. We didn't realize that when you make things at scale, things get harder. Yeah, it's supposed to get cheaper when you make it at scale. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, Linus Tech Tips just posted a video about uh, like why it took us uh, three years to introduce our new screwdrivers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's special like Linus Tech Tips branded screwdrivers uh, that they're that they're producing. But it's like it took us three years and so so much money to make these. <laughs> yeah. And it's a screwdriver. Like people know how to make. It's not like a new product that people haven't made before. <laughs> It's not even electronic. Yeah. <laughs> but it still takes that amount of time. I've heard the, the big one is uh, ballpoint pens. Oh, you see. They're like a, a gate of um, <clears throat> precision manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Like they're more difficult to fabricate than you might think. What's that? that yeah, that iridium tip. Iridium? Or at least there are on the... It's, it's, that's some of the fountain pens I use. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, it turns out uh, when you need an incredibly small and incredibly smooth ball, not a ball bearing, because that's a bearing that's made up of balls, it's, it's not an easy thing to make. That's one of my favorite scenes from the old, uh, the, uh, some semi-fictitious history of Gynex, Otaku no Video. Yes, I was just thinking about that. There's a portion where uh, one of the creators of Gynex, because they're getting started in uh, in merch manufacturing, has to go over to China to uh, to deal with the factories there. Yeah, you know, they mentioned like abundant Chinese labor. Yep, and secure and like that, contracts. That. that um, a shot of just like panning across all the oh, factory workers. Yeah, just factories. It's probably factory. time for a rewatch. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, at this stage, yeah. I definitely watched that when I did not have the whole context for what exactly it meant. And I also thought that the interviews were like for real. Yeah, so did I for a while. They, for those They're not so convincing. For, for those not aware, the Otaku no video is a, uh, as I said, a semi autobiographical. Uh, OVA, two, two episodes about the founding of Gynex, and it's interspersed with these interviews with otaku. Portrait of an Otaku. Yes. And, uh... They are played so dead straight. Oh, yeah. But they're absolutely a... T taking the absolute kiss out of the, uh... It's Otaku like community. the one where the guy's playing the Eroke, okay, and he asks him if he's ever had a real girlfriend, and he just starts stuttering. Mm -hmm. Oh god, it's so awful. <laughs> they actually interview a weeaboo in that. They like Oh, that's right. Yeah, they, they talk to like the American guy who's yeah. just like so stoked to be in Japan. Yeah. And of course the office worker who uh, who has a char asdwell helmet at his office desk. That, that, that's what should have tipped us off, honestly. Yeah. It's so funny. <laughs> he like pulls it out of hammer space. Yeah. Okay, I think this one went a lot better. Partly because I put markings on oh, both that, sides. That looks nice and sharp. Bleh. Oh wait, 
I need to, I think this might be still too thick. <laughs> just a wee bit. Yeah, a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a cheeky little taut. So I'll take a little bit off of this end. So I'll have to get way into woodworking and then eventually make one of those amazing planes where you see the elderly Japanese guys just like taking yep. giant sheets of paper off of logs. Oh, we have to go do the uh, do the competition then. It's just like, and now he has made a plane that is sharper than the sharpest thing that's ever been sharpened. <laughs> and he's going to turn this log into tissue paper in one stroke. <laughs> No one, no one does that kind of, uh, you know, master, master craftsmanship thing better than than the Japanese. And what what I love always though is that like you know that guy making, you know, who's the expert plane maker, is making his planes, you know, using tools that were each made by experts in whatever you know. He's using a pair of scissors made by a guy who's been making scissors for, you know, 50 years <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to yeah. cut his thing that he's, you know, he's using like every aspect of it is like masters all the way down. It's amazing stuff. It's, it's amazing that they still maintain the, uh, that, that sort of almost uh, master and apprentice-ish tradition. Mm. I yeah, was stop. reading an article recently about uh, they're having trouble finding people to become sword maker apprentices. Well, I heard that the way that um, a lot of sword makers sort of survived their business kind of just disappearing is they got into cutlery. Mm -hmm. So like they do, um, they supply bespoke kitchen knives, which are still and probably will for the foreseeable future be popular craft just, items. This is just like a very, very, very small katana. That's really <laughs> essentially, essentially what they're doing. It's like... I mean, it, there was just last week a uh, they shut down the Yamanote line for a, a half hour because a sushi chef who was moving between uh, between restaurants had a nap on the train and let go of his bag oh, no. that had the knives in it, oh, and they boy. fell out. And Japanese uh, blade laws are extremely strict in that you can you can own knives that are you know of certain length, but unless you have a reason to be using them immediately, like if you're going camping, you can take a big long knife out in the car with you. There's but no if, like oh, like uh, everyday carry. Like taking them on a public. Thing. It's a big note. Well, taking on a public thing, that's fine too, as long as you were just going in between the two locations. But was, they, they were describing it that uh, the police, if you were stopped by the police and you, they find a knife in your car and it's not there being transported, that's a, uh, th that is a arrestable offense. I thought for a sec that you were saying, you said the, the, line, the, the line was uh, uh, shut down for half an hour. Uh, because there was a famous sushi chef sleeping on it and nobody wanted to wake him up. <laughs> I thought it would be like unbelievably rude. Jiro's dreaming of sushi. <laughs> hey! We have an upright. Let me see if this one fits. We're going to attempt the second one. Examine the work. Well, I'm glad we got something. Assembled. Yeah, no, we. Tell people, what's this we business? You did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's. That's in there. Man, there will be amazing artisanal guillotines in, in Japan. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Oof. Japan does kind of have a reputation for taking existing things and then like refining them to their logical extremes. That is basically the modus operandi. And adding a 
quintessential Japanese you know, food. Yeah, like making it tiny and cute. <laughs> There's a book I, I, I think you should definitely uh, check out, in either in audiobook or in uh, paper form if you've got the time, Alex. And that's, uh, What's that? Uh, Matt Alt uh, wrote a book called Pure Invention. Uh, the name is a reference to a quote from uh, Oscar Wilde talking about uh, the, the uh, Come with me and you'll see world of pure invention. Although now that we've learned about uh, about the original maker of the guillotine, I am now now I just kind of want like a, 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 a somebody to make like a custom like uh, somehow make like a piano like a guillotine piano Ooh. or something like just as a tribute to the original. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess the, the easiest way to do that is to put the blade right on the cover of the keyboard. Mm. I've, 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 I guess the blade is just hovering over over the over keyboard. the hands the whole time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to that end, I have been playing the Rose of Versailles theme song in my head this whole stream. Is that the main crossbar? Main crossbar. Part uh, B and C. I'm looking for part C. Okay. Which should be. Any spot? I think that. I just kind of want to like try to get us something to look at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're very close. To 80 plus. Like these have all been measured previously, but how long is this in total? Uh, it's 80. 26. My mind is losing me, so that's 106, 126, 132. Well, this one is 135. 26 plus 26 plus 80, 132. Okay, so this one's a little long, but not by much. I mean, mm. you deliberately cut them long, right? Sure, but with a crossbar, I think that's the one, one of those things you want to be properly with <laughs> well I mean I don't think it would be hard to cut that off oh absolutely yeah you're right yeah okay so 26 26 from each edge These upright supporters should be fastened to A and D and E by means of pins. Yeah, I haven't decided whether I want to use like wooden pins or brass pins. That's a good question. Because I have both. Brass would definitely look nice. Yeah, it's hard to say no to brass just because it rules. Yeah, but wood would definitely, you could definitely fill in those uh, edges a little bit easier. Uh, the spawn of Hastur's, I was asking if you've ever cured your own bacon. That's a good question. No, I have not cured my you own bacon. You've got to be careful with like charcuterie, don't you? You do have to be careful whenever you're, uh, you're, you're curing anything like that. Hey, um, you, you've done some meat curing, haven't you? I thought you had done... I th Maybe I'm just thinking of the cheese that you, you were making cheese. Yeah, I think, I've, I think I've talked a big game about doing meat curing at some point. Ah. But I haven't actually done it yet. It's, it's on the list of things I'd like to try. So yeah, my bacon might not be a bad, uh, bad start for that. My big problem is that the pork belly just doesn't last in my house. <laughs> Oh no, I've got a great recipe for carnitas from that stuff. It's, mm. now, this, this is something that, uh, that, that, that uh, Brad of, uh, of that terrible uh, cooking place, Bon Appetit, was getting in trouble about. Uh, just because he <laughs> uh, suggested to people some, I want to say, uh, not industry standard or safe tactics for uh for, for curing your meat and, uh, and oh and yeah curing some uh, uh, and other fermented uh, issues 
I see. Yeah, I think he was. Yeah, yeah, you got you got to be careful with the uh, the YouTube advice. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> or Twitch advice. Yes. Uh, what you see on this show is not necessarily uh, exactly what you you should probably <laughs> do your own figuring out on how to do things. Oh, well, there is a reason that I start every episode <laughs> by saying this is not a how-to. This is a let's try. You're responsible for your own safety because I trust you, Chaz. You're a bold man. I, <laughs> I mean, I can't do anything about that, unfortunately. I mean, I could grow this out and just have a... No, bold man. Oh. <laughs> to talk about my terrible mullet. You have a mullet? I mean, I could. It's a quantum it's mullet. A qualit. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you do have a terrible. Uh, your your mullet is extremely poor <laughs> it's right, right, right now. It's, on the it's wrong like it's not side. even what there, the idiot. <laughs> we took the mullet and we rotated it along the z-axis by about ninety degrees. And it vanished from existence. <laughs> well, it's just down here now. Oh God. Uh, what is what is a, a beard if not a face mullet? Party on top, business on the chin. Nope. Don't even want to think about what the implications of that. But yeah, I've been I I I I've, I've been curious to do uh, meat curing and uh, curious. Just, well, <laughs> waiting for uh, for a good wine fridge to show up on one of the used uh, places. I mean, it it does seem like one of those things that is not terribly practical to do at small scale, like it sort of only kind of works at large scale. It's like mm -hmm. medium scale. It's like uranium uh, manufacturing. Yeah. Very similar <laughs> very, in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah like when the smallest uh, when the smallest you can do is it was one chub. That's uh, it's significant. Less jokingly, it is interesting that the reason individuals can't own uranium is that the manufacturing process is gargantuan. Mm -hmm. And there's no shortcut. Like, there's no way to make it, like, to do small batch there's bespoke small uranium. <laughs> free uranium refinement. Um, so, like, the only the only people capable of creating it are, like, enormous companies or, like, a nation. Which, uh, well, maybe for the best. Yeah. Probably. I don't think people should be making their own uranium. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if you see a YouTube tutorial about that, maybe maybe don't don't follow it. Yeah. That's a that's a good idea. That's our piece of advice. Don't make your own uranium. Well, you can't. Yeah. Don't, don't try. Not only will you fail at what you're trying to do. You would go broke. Uh, yeah. At worst. Yep. Or at best, actually. Where's my square? I have no square. Uh, you must scream. Where did it go? That's a good question. There it is. There we go. Come with me and you'll see to the tomb of full annihilation. <laughs> now that said, you can make your own uh, cyclotron. Yeah, and you can make your own cloud chamber, mm -hmm. which is a project I want to do on here at some point. Honestly, playing with the uh, playing with uranium and, and nuclear reactions in that respect doesn't interest me as a as, as, as a fun thing to do, because it all it is is making things hot. Yeah, no fun allowed. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, one of the incredibly terrifying things about radiation is that. Uh, it's not visually exciting. Yeah, it's a very good point. There's not you, much to see. It's just like you died t two hours ago. You just didn't know <laughs> about it. This is a case of, well, tune in next week on Tinker Taylor Soldier Fry, where this program will be hosted by someone else. Yeah. It's like, next week we'll be soldering a zinc casket closed. <laughs> Ooh. And then, Thanks, zinc. Oh, God. Ugh. No nuclear fusion, on the other hand another like prohibitively it, 
I mean, it is, does always seem funny to me that, like, all power plants are, uh, like, turbine power plants. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, it's like, it's like, there are hundreds of different ways of making water heat up so you can run it through a turbine. Yep. Yeah. But people. that's the only way we figured out to do it. <laughs> I know people who are disappointed when they find out that nuclear water is just a giant kettle. Yeah. It's like, yeah. what do you mean you boil water with it? It's the only, it's the, so far the best way we figure out how to turn, like, Therm heat, like yeah, thermal heat energy. into energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, CNS, first time catching uh, TTSF, are these typical conversation topics? Absolutely oh, yeah. they are. Definitely. True. Solar and wind aren't. That's true. That's mm -hmm. true. I mean, solar is not even like like wind is still turning a turbine. Yes, yeah, solar is actually kind of the, the solar is the most sci-fi. Yeah. That. That's catching actual free electrons and putting them places. It's pretty cool. This is what I assumed fusion was back when I was a kid. The idea of just taking a plasma and just harvesting the electrons out of it. Mm. Just take the electrons. Yeah. Although people have made, like there are solar, like the solar towers that again use just use mirrors to use solar to yep. heat water to turn a turbine. In fact, I just recently saw which a... is actually yeah, like almost almost as efficient, if not more efficient than actual solar panels. There was a a, a, a group of people who run one of those uh, power plants down, I think, in Utah who just recently posted their paper about uh, roasting pepper, hot peppers with their uh, <laughs> salt. Yeah, yeah, with, 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 their, with their molten salt uh, solar array. It's so wild that molten salt is uh, a proposed reactor coolant. Oh, it's such a good idea. Yeah, here it's pretty good. It's like uh, molten salt, and there was another one that they, they had experimentally that worked really great. Thorium. No, I think it was sodium. Oh yes, or not, yeah. not sodium. Or what's the one that explodes when it touches water? Is that's that sodium? sodium? Yeah, sodium. they did that, and it worked great. They just had to be very careful that no moisture got in ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is difficult. So it's like, okay, so we're gonna make, we're gonna make this kettle, that we're gonna use the hot stuff to boil water and then put it through the thing and then to cool it yeah. we're going to use the stuff that can never ever touch water or it will be very or bad. it will explode and destroy everything <laughs> great plan right yeah. oh yeah <laughs> we got this big block where we put them really close to each other yeah no it was a uh... It was a, Neil Stevenson's book, Termination Shock, that really kind of put it in perspective for me. So one of the oil men was saying that the, the, the history of humans' uh, progress scientifically, uh, progress in terms of science and uh, efficiency and, and product production, is all based on humans burning things that they dug up out of the uh, out of the earth. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're pretty good at burning stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's basically all we do is burn things to make things happen. I'm still very tickled that um, coal power is more radioactive than nuclear power. I did not know that. You that didn't know that? That upsets me. Oh man, <laughs> it's so good. Like coal dust intrinsically has more radioactivity in it than an average nuclear plant puts <sighs> out. Coal is terrible. I mean, that's, but that's the thing about nuclear plants. They're not supposed to let n nuclear radiation out. Yeah, exactly. They're very safe. I'm one of those like weird advocates that's aware of the all the like horrendous disasters oh, that yeah. are in its history, and I'm still like, yeah, nuclear is great. I mean, that's <laughs> you're describing another reason why uh, the same similar reasons as to why I'm an anime fan. <laughs> <laughs> anime is garbage, and I love it. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes a horrible catastrophe happens, but otherwise it's okay. Yeah, we don't. Not every day we have to watch Twinkle Nora rock me. I thought you were going to say Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Star. Uh, <laughs> lucky Star? Yeah, Lucky Star. I buy sausage. So what's your opinion on the uh, on, on the small modular reactors that can't... I've heard they're at? great. Um, I feel like Lauren tells me that uh, they're great too. She um, 
goes by Atomic Marshmallow mm -hmm. on Twitter, uh, and she works in the nuclear industry and has, I think, occasionally mentions SMRs as being kind of sweet, where like you you build a facility that has like a big pool, and you can just like add reactors to it. Oh, it makes so much sense. So it's basically like reactor pool party. <laughs> Have they actually made any of these? Uh, maybe? I think they might be in the prototype phase. The way you said that, it's like, so what do you think of these uh, of these small uh, modular reactors? Uh, you know, they've been getting pretty pretty popular. Like, it sounds, it sounds you know, like uh, talking about, I don't know, 3D printers or something. It's <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, like, there's a couple ones right now that, like, the prices are really coming down. They you know? <laughs> really are. It's, uh... Uh, you know, I think that I think I think we're gonna hit, like hit the hit the stage where uh, they're gonna really take off. <laughs> I think what I like most about them too is that they are uh, they look like IG88's head. Ah! that's fantastic. Now I don't want to be premature, but I think I'm starting to get the hang of this I a little think, bit. Yeah, you are definitely. Definitely making it quicker work of these. And plus, you've made all these great chips for the smoker. I, uh, I was also I was looking at this. I saw this interesting article that was talking about, um, you know, some of the the Fukushima um, fallout stuff. And there, it was it was specifically calling out a thing that was like, you know, a one one year later or or, or a couple years later showing there's like an increase in radiation uh like it showed like the sort of wave of radiation coming across across the pacific right. in, into the the west coast and the the person was talking about like the interesting thing about radiation is that uh we are very 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 good at detecting it Ooh. yeah and like so you can, you can pick up the teensiest little amounts of it which is and so it's like it's up. like because of the way this was presented and like the scary red coloring yep and it's like this is an entirely true graph but what they don't show you is that this is yes. like the amount the amount of radiation that has increased is like uh, traveling in an airplane like near you know uh, uh near to you know higher up in the air so there's less yeah uh thing it's it, or it's like eating a banana or whatever yeah. it's like <laughs> the actual amount the banana, of radiation difference is so minor the banana equivalent dose were like to eat a number of bananas to get any sort of radiological symptoms would put you in like crushing danger it's like you'd have to eat like a cargo ship full yeah, of them you'd be you'd have to worry more about the atomic amount of potassium you're getting yeah i also love that you know, again, because we're so good at detecting radioactive, that, like how, you know, carbon dating, and that carbon dating stops working it, the, the, you know, the moment, the very, very first yep. atmospheric nuclear test. Explosion. Everywhere yes. in the entire world thin line in was covered in nuclear radiation, like, there are nuclear atoms. I at, didn't know that. Yeah, there are, there are atoms of of radioactivity uh, everywhere in the entire world at the exact same like layer of time. Yep. Uh, because Be because that's, of the Trinity device. Because yep. because of uh, nuclear tests, um, which means that we can uh, not only can we radiocarbon date anything earlier than that. But we can also figure out when, like, if something was covered or not yeah, at that time. Life. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. You'd be like, the last time this thing was uncovered was X. The follow-up to that, too, was uh, I was watching uh, James May's Our Man in Italy. And he took a tour of a neutrino detector facility there. Those are so weird looking. They are weird to begin with. But this one is in the inside of a mountain, because that's where you put them. But in addition to the mountain, the uh, the actual facility itself is filled with specifically Roman era lead ingots. Oh right, right, right. And somebody in the chat was saying that people uh, dive and get pre World War II shipwrecks yep. 
for the same reason that you need iron and lead and things that have not been contaminated. Exactly. It's fascinating. That. <laughs> Paul, are you familiar with uh, Oklo? Uh, you don't know. This is one of my favorite things ever. Uh, I, thought, I thought you might be like, Oklo these nuts. <laughs> or no. So <laughs> I don't right. remember exactly where it is. I want to say it's in like it wasn't some the Netherlands trick. or something. The, there was a, uh, a mining operation going there. They're pulling it, um, out uh, urani like natural uranium. And natural uranium is very, very predictable. It, um, most of the radioactivity in it comes from the concentration of U-235. There's one of the isotopes in there that constitutes like basically all the radioactivity in it. And there's a very, very thick, like reliable fixed amount uh, in naturally occurring ores. And when they pulled the ore out of this area, you know, they were doing their due diligence and testing it, mm -hmm. and it was like substantially lower. And they're like, that's impossible. Yeah, that shouldn't be. So it's just like pre-enriched, like- they're... Well, it's not enriched, it, like it's, it had been like burned off. And they're just like, that can't happen. It, it, it's like tapping a well and getting pure gasoline out of it. Yeah. Uh, except what they found out or they theorized, because it, it was the only thing that made sense, was that at one point, the geological formation of the uranium and like natural water formed a, a naturally occurring nuclear reactor Like there's that was able to self-sustain. Like, so there's basically a bunch of uranium and then somehow and then it, got, it, got, by, yeah, by and then it got pressurized. Well, it, it, there was like uranium and then like water acting as a, a moderator and it was able to sustain a reaction and it would like flare up and then die down for a bit and then flare up again for like... Mm -hmm. But like, I thought the whole thing was that like naturally occurring uranium, the the actual visible fissionable part of it is so uncommon like you have to that's why you have to enrich it in order to actually make it use make yeah, it for, make it work for for, for big for big scale stuff you can get um reactivity out of natural uranium but it's like very small mm -hmm. like i think they right i guess if you're willing to wait a hundred thousand years for your thing to do its thing then yeah you could probably yeah, yeah like um i think i want to say chicago pile one used natural uranium um, the CP1 was um, the first self-sustaining nuclear pile, and they built a bunch of like um, calibrating uh, piles leading up to that to figure out how big it had to be. Um, and all the graphite from that ended up like scattered to the four winds, including um, the basement at um, what's that? Uh, MIT, I think, where somebody who was like randomly rooting around in the cellars was like, oh, what's all this stuff? And they found a bunch of these graphite bricks <sighs> and they rebuilt it. And it is now a teaching um, utensil oh, where students actually get to load real fuel into the, the pile and take readings. Like it, it reacts, but it's like at tiny levels that, it, you know, so that it's not like dangerous or That's anything cool as hell. but it's very very cool I, I know that it is a technical term but the fact that it's just called like a pile, a pile. Yeah. that's because it, it is there's like there's no exaggeration it's a stack of uh, graphite blocks with fuel elements interspersed throughout it it just it, it implies a level of uh, disorganization and kind of uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, throw it on the pile. Come on down to the pile. <laughs> At least like a, like a, a nuclear stack. Yeah. Please. Nope, it's a pile. What's interesting is um, only fairly recently did photographs get declassified of um, the Soviet nuclear program. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of ones that are like, have some eerie similarity because like they stole all the, um, the information from the Americans. So you have like their version of CP1 and their version of the Trinity device. And a thing that I discovered like last week, their first bomb called uh, First Lightning, uh, I had only ever seen in profile. 
and it looks almost exactly like the, the Fat Man bomb mm -hmm. with this big weird windshield on the front. Ooh. And seriously, like a week ago, I saw a front-on version and it has two of those windshields. It looks like a bug. Oh, it's a trainer. With big like eyes. I think that they're like radar sensors <laughs> or something. It looks so fucking weird. Yeah, I saw those on your tw on your feed. Was there... It it, yeah, messed it looks me like up. a guppy. Yeah, I mean it could have been like a Pokemon or something. Oh God, like the uh, the owl ship. Yeah, that's what it looked like. It looked exactly like the owl ship from. Uh, um, uh, I almost said the Avengers. <laughs> hey! The, the, the other nuclear thing that I, I love uh, talking about. You made the mistake of like yeah, discussing I, I, I really my special did. interest. <laughs> that people don't really talk enough about are, are, are the uh, are, are the medical isotope reactors that are out there. There's lots of like, I mean, I think a lot of that um, is the sort of bread and butter of uh, like at least parts of the nuclear industry. Oh, was... Like I saw a great um, walking tour of uh, this react, this like scientific reactor, and they do a lot of experiments and like medical isotope production, where they'll just like take a material and stick it in to be irradiated and then it comes out as something else mm -hmm. that's like more useful. It's like, ah, oh, we can use this to treat cancer now. I mean, there are, there are a surprisingly large number of medical things involved in, you know, very closely controlled radiation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like, what's fascinating is, um, I think there's a process called doping where they'll take a material like silicon, or for example, uh, and they'll just expose it to radiation, and it will transmute some of its atoms into different atoms, Hurrah. thereby changing the properties of the material. And I think that's cool as heck. I mean, I do love that we've gotten to the point where, you know, the we can, you know, the philosopher's stone. Changing lead into gold is completely doable. I like we can do it. It's just not cost effective. We can do it no problem. But the stuff you need to make it happen is worth more than gold. So I just want to say it's incredibly <laughs> alchemical. It's but it's, it's just like yeah, we can. It turns out we can turn lead into gold. But it turns out that gold uh, is not is pretty common <laughs> compared to this kind of stuff that we want to make. <laughs> It's like, gold is not even the most expensive thing. It's like, really? It's like, let me tell you about iridium. Hey, look, we're doing, we're making things because we need them, not because we just want shiny money. Let's talk about osmium. Oh. Yeah, now if you could turn lead into, you know, Roman era lead, that would be mm -hmm. super handy. I mean, thankfully, uranium does a lot of work turning things into helium. We do need a bunch more of that. Yep. Go mine the helium on the moon. Don't mine things on the moon. Really? I, I, I don't want the capitalism up there, Alex. Maybe, maybe go for the asteroids, but let's, let's leave the... Uh, the capitalism is going to the moon. I know, the capitalism, I know. Is already, the capitalism is already there. I know. You don't have to like it. It was a. Uh, it was something I was just reading about today, specifically. It's like lunar mining. Yeah, well, it's, and specifically the currently existing treaties uh, that exist. Yeah, like, like who owns the moon? No. Nope. One. Yeah, there's there's specifically no uh, commercial exploitation of space. There is a current treaty to do stop that. Well, it's it's, it's not even that there's no commercial uh, aspects of space. It's it's that there is no one, according to the current uh, international treaties. <laughs> No one can claim ownership of any uh, non-terrestrial body. Wait a minute. Are you saying that that deed to a star I have is not valid? <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> or you, you, you would specifically the words are you can't claim sovereignty of a uh, of a, a celestial body. That said, uh, products made from things obtained on those bodies may not be covered by that law. 
especially under the Artemis Protocols that have been put forward by the Americans, but have not been ratified by the UN or any of the other nations. And it, 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 it all comes down really to water is the issue here. Because it's always water. Yeah. It always is. We, we kind of need it. It's okay, I guess. That's going to be, that's going to do the job. Yeah. yeah. So I guess eventually that will get yeah, that will a part between the, that's uh, down here. Oh, down is here. Okay. Yeah. The but that's gonna be that. Top part is around here somewhere. So we can pretend that it goes like that. <clears throat> somewhere around that. Well, it's a start. It's it's a heck of a start. This no is one be... can say that it is not a start. No, but uh, we have definitely gone past the point of no return on making this into a guillotine. I don't think we can make this into a harpsichord anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think that's going to have to do it. We're actually a little bit over time here, which has been a golly. while since we've done that here on the program. So thank you so much, Alex, for coming by. And Yeah, uh, we'll uh, see about um, continuing this at a later date. Yes. And I don't know, maybe I'll do some more fabrication at home. That sounds like um, a good plan. But yeah, we'll be back in the future to uh, complete and work more on this program. We'll get this done. But uh, Before anything else, I want to make sure to remind you that you can go to patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun if you'd like to support us. That's one of many places, including patreon.com. Also, you can go to youtube.com and check out our multitude of channels there, where you can also become a, uh, a, a member and ask us questions in our weekly ask -er, monthly ask alerts. <laughs> Uh, and of course, give us super thanks there. And of course, uh, we want to thank you all for watching. I didn't watching. think they had rolled out super thanks yet. Yeah, yeah. Yes, th yes, it is. <laughs> Good. I just want to make sure that, that I'm, I'm on the same page. Yes. But thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Either you're just watching in the chat, chatting away, or uh, lurking. We love you all. And we will see you next time on Taylor, Taylor Solder Fry. Ever forward. Ever learn. learning. Out of, no, we are now learning out of spite. Oh, I like that. We'll see you next time.